Dungannon, a compelling drama based on real events. Some of the characters have been fictionalised and events changed for dramatic effect. I have a dream this afternoon. The Negroes will be able to buy a house or rent a house anywhere that their money will carry them and they will be able to get a job. Mommy, our Eileen is called in the kitchen again. I'm Tommy and me have to make our tea yet. Eileen, will you hurry out of here? Oh, she always does that. And she leaves her wash and drying over the banisters, a messy car. You can't dawdle when you have a house full like we have. Eileen! Eileen! I have to make up the baby's bottle. Eileen! <sighs> Poor wee thing is hungry. Oh, God love him. You need a break, love. You and Tommy both. Chance would be a fine thing. Look, we're all on top of each other here. Can hardly breathe in this house. You two need to get out. How can we? With Cahill here. Oh, look after him. There's a great picture on in the Aston. That touch of mink. Carrie Grant and Dar's Day. Oh, God, Mummy, I'd love it. Tommy and me haven't been out for ages. Look, everybody needs a break now and again. There's life outside these four walls, you know. Father. Mm. Uh, well, yes, why not? <laughs> oh, oh, not too much now, or you'll have me singing. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> and you, Eamon? Pour away, Patricia. The man probably hasn't had a decent drop of good Irish since he left. No, oh, oh, no, you're not way. drinking like an Irishman oh. anymore, Eamon, you know. No way. Let me tell you, Con, there's more Irish bars in Los Angeles Snatch. than Dungannon. Fact. <laughs> now, where was I? The pool. Oh, yes, the pool. Well, as I was saying, Mary was going on at me for ages. See, it's a sort of status symbol out there about how when you visit other consultants' houses, they always show you their pool. Yeah. Here, it's only accountants yeah. and parish priests do things like that. <laughs> oh, you're a terrible man. Con, <laughs> let Eamon get a word in. Oh, sorry, sorry, Eamon. Right, the pool. Well, the upshot is, as soon as I get back home, it's going to be starting. Oh, your own swimming pool, just like in the pictures. You hear that, Con? I'm not deaf. America's been good to you, Eamon. Sure has, Father. The land of opportunity. Why, if I'd stayed here, I'd probably ended up just like... Just like... Me? What? Con. No, I, I didn't mean... Uh, uh... Oh, I'm only joking, Eamon. <laughs> All I'm saying is, look, fair play to you. I've spent ten years applying for every consultancy vacancy in every hospital in the six counties. And as soon as you step off the plane in America, you were snapped up right away. Eamon knows all that. All I'm wondering is, yeah, you've got a great life there, but would you have gone? Would you have left home and family if... if things had been different here? Probably not. What sort of question is that? His life's there now. No, Patricia. That's fair enough. Sure, yes, I miss home. If I could live here with all that I've got there, well... I bet you couldn't. Con. You'd be like me, as you said, pool-less. What? <laughs> Not, of course, that there's much use for swimming pools in Dungannon. <laughs> ah, well, anyway, aren't you well out of it? Things will never change here. See, in the States, doesn't matter who you are, what religion you are, the opportunities are there. As long as you're not black, of course. But then the blacks are demanding their rights mm. now. Oh, that Martin Luther King's a great man, a great man. Could do with somebody like him here. But anyway, you're doing all right, Con, aren't you? Lovely house, lawn overlooking the town. <laughs> Pay big bucks for this in L.A. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we're all right. We are up here. The Cahill, the... Poor wee man. <laughs> How's he doing? Oh, he's hot, Mommy. He's awful hot. It's burning up, is it? Look, Tommy and me will not go out tonight. Ah, oh, yes, you will, Aunt Tommy. You two need to get out of this house, you hear me? Oh, no, Mommy. Here, yes. give me him. There. Ah, oh, sure. Cahill be fine with his old granny, so he will. Get going now before I change my mind. <laughs> anyway, it'll make more room for the rest of us to turn round with you two out of the house. In the county Tyrone, near the town of Dungannon, <coughs> where there's many's a ruction myself had a hand in. <laughs> Bob Williamson lived the weaver by trade, and all of us thought of us out of his blade. Fine voice tonight, Father. <coughs> this party piece, that. A mighty song, a mighty song. <laughs> I, I was singing it at a function one time, and some GAA boys from next door heard and came in to sort me out. <laughs> and when they saw it was a priest, oh, <laughs> their faces. Another <laughs> verse, father. Go on with the drinks in you. Well, now, now, let's see if I can remember it. Oh, 
The twelfth, of course. <laughs> on the twelfth of July, as it yearly did come, Bob played on the flute to the sound of the drum. You may talk of your harp or piano or lute, but there's nothing can rival the old orange flute. More, father, you must remember more. But Bob, the deceiver, he took us all in. For he married a papish called Bridget McGinn. Turned papish himself and forsook the old cause. That gave us our freedom, religion and law. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you'll excuse me, I, I just have to go. Uh, oh, it's all right. Uh, you know where it is, Father. I'll find Up, it. Upstairs, upstairs, first on the right. Hey, some character, isn't he? Oh, it's not easy stopping a multi-start singer. Oh. Great song, though. He sings that anywhere at the drop of a hat. It's one of those rare songs where you're not quite sure who'll be offended by it. <laughs> it's as if by singing it we place ourselves above all that. All that sectarian stuff. As if it's nothing to do with us. That's why we can laugh at it. Well, isn't that what he's saying? What are you going on about, Patricia? It's just interesting, don't you think? He says... Why should the devil have all the good tunes? That's why he sings it. Simple as that. Hey, good point. When I worked in Glasgow, if anyone sang that in a Catholic area, it would have caused a riot. But here in Dungannon, it's assumed nobody will take offence. Oh, well, certainly not amongst our own well-mannered, civilised, middle-class collection of friends, it won't. I don't know. Makes me a bit uneasy. It's as if we protested too much. You know what I mean? But the world is changing, Patricia. Everybody's against discrimination. That's right. As a matter of interest, who cleans your house, Ellen? Well, what do you mean? What colours her skin? Well, black. And how many black consultants do you work with? What? <laughs> but all that's going to change. I mean, even here, surely all that sectarianism and stuff's on the way out. Hey, maybe Dungannon could lead the way. Wouldn't hold me breath. Now, where's that other list, Raymond? Ah, tea and biscuits. Thank you, love. Just put the tray down there. Yeah, lovely. Now, help yourself to a biscuit, Raymond. Have you got the list? Uh, here they are. Uh, the list of applicants for the Killyman Road Estate. Oh, good. 142 new houses. Pat them back to the council, why not? And to you too, Mr. McMaster. <laughs> <laughs> right, Raymond. So, who, uh, who are the lucky ones? Um, Danny Thomas. <laughs> are we giving houses to children now? Well, the boy's 18. Never. He is. He's proposed to Michelle Dunlop. Oh. Lucky man, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they'll be needing a house. No, 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 not Danny. Better not. The families must come first, only fair. Danny can wait his turn. But he doesn't have to. Uh, look, we don't have enough families, even married couples, to fill the new houses. Ah. Not in Don Gannon, anyway. Right, so then Danny and Michelle get, uh, an early wedding present, eh? Uh, to continue, <clears throat> from Moigasho, James and Eleanor Hill, two children. From Castle Caulfield, David and Evelyn Stewart, no children, but they're trying for a family. Good, good. Go on. Uh, Jennifer Smith, uh, another one from Moigasho, uh, single. Uh, Skates on, Raymond. The meeting's starting in half an hour. Let's hear the rest. Give me one good reason why any nationalist councillor should turn up at that council meeting. Because your nationalist councillors elected by the people of the nationalist ward. Aye, and much good it does us when they won't even build GAA facilities and the new sports ground. And until they do, we will continue our boycott. The least you can do is turn up and represent your own people. Like you, Jim, eh? Turning up faithfully to record your vote. What's the point when you get kicked in the teeth every time? Look, can't you get it out of your head? Nothing will ever change here till we get rid of the border. So you do nothing? Wrong. We're setting petitions to the United Nations. The President of the United States is holding us the Pope. But precisely. What? Nothing. You're doing nothing. 
why not put pressure on the people who can actually do something about it? Like Westminster, Stormont. I'm glad we'll be recognising the constitutional position of the six These counties. people couldn't care less about constitutional positions. Look, they just want a fair chance at decent housing. At least they can say I've turned up to fight their corner. Uh, hello, Angela. Mm. Now, how do I know you boys will be sitting here? Now, look at you. Sure, you're like a June bride. We're waiting for the others. Do you want to drink? No. You're looking for Tommy? No, Tommy's outside. Well, what can we do for you? When are we going to get a house? Look, oh, Angela. Ask the unionists. They are the ones with the power, not us. We are just the second class citizens here. But I am asking you. All of you. We voted for you as our councillors. What are you doing apart from sitting around in bars drinking? Now, Angela, that's... And will my family have a decent place to live? There aren't any houses. There are! Aren't you doling out 142 of them tonight at the council meeting in half an hour's time? Angela, you know rightly that... I'll have one of those, thank you very much. But those houses on the Killyman Road, Protestants only. So? So you won't get them. That's it. That's it. And that's why we won't set one foot in that meeting. It's a brick wall. What's the point? Seven nationalist councillors in the West Ward representing half the population of the town. As against 14 unionists in the other two wards representing the other half of the population. Simple maths. A guaranteed majority. I believe jolly mandarin is the technical term. Jim, I... Look, he's right, Angela. But somebody has to keep an eye on them, and I'm going on. Anybody else coming? Right, now we'll move on to the business of the new houses the council has built on the Killyman Road. Uh, Councillor Hardy, I believe that in conjunction with the Housing Committee, you have arrived at a list of suggested tenants. Uh, yes, indeed. Excellent. Then I suggest we proceed to a vote. Uh, just a second, Mr McMaster. Yes? Uh, I haven't seen the tenancy list. Well, if you... Uh... Now, I don't know the names of those lucky people who'll be moving into those houses on the Killyman Road. But I can say with absolute authority that they will all have one thing yes. in common. Mr. Corrigan... Now, every uh, last one of them is a Protestant. Mr. Corrigan, as you well know, those are Unionist houses <laughs> in a Unionist war. Protestant. Protestant houses. Whatever you prefer. But for the record, uh, and I, I see we have the local press here tonight, the agreement, the, the gentleman's agreement, that we have had for the last 20 years. Nationalist councils allocate houses in the Nationalist ward. And we do the same. But there never are new houses in the Nationalist ward. The council hasn't built a Catholic house for 34 years. H have you finished? And why? Because every Catholic householder means another Catholic voter. And you don't want too many of them. Oh no. God knows what might happen. There's only one way a Catholic can get a council house in this town. And that's if another Catholic vacates it, usually in a coffin. Yes, I'd like to thank Councillor Corrigan for his passionate words. But I'm afraid none of this can alter the simple purpose of tonight's meeting, to allocate the houses on the Killyman Road. So, uh, if I can have a show of hands. Right. Uh, those for the recommended tenants of the Housing Committee? Ah, yes, that's... Uh, uh, Fourteen. And those against? Oh. <laughs> Going, Mr. Corrigan? Great picture of the guy. Oh, I did too. Give us a chip. Oh, no, I paid for him. No. Give us a chip. No, get your hands off. You had yours. Go away. Ah, go on. One chip won't kill you. No, you greedy pig. <laughs> a great <laughs> night, wasn't it? Yeah, but I just want to get to bed now. Oh, oh God, drop the key. Oh, Mommy, I didn't want to get you up. Angela, love. What's wrong? Look, uh, d don't be worried. Is it Cahill? How's Cahill? I've called out the doctor. Ann Street, baby boy. Probably nothing, but he's disabled. Uh, good job I wasn't drinking so I could drive. Uh, give her some welly, Patricia. There's a speed limit, you know. I'll tell you to get back to me, bed. I'm going as fast as I can. Oh, Look up ahead. Oh, no. Not again. Now, don't you say anything. Would you look who it is? Bertie Turner. That's all I need. Con? Be special's name? You know our Con. name. Con? Patricia McCluskey. And you? Con McCluskey. Why? Right. What's your business here in Dungannon? We live here, Bertie. Is that so? 
I'm a Dr. Bertie, your brother's doctor. Out of the car, doctor. But he searched us this morning. Is that right? Get out of the car. Look, Bertie, I'm rushing to attend a patient, a very sick patient. I said get out of the car. So we rushed here as fast as we could. We told them we were in call. Made no difference. Would you like another cup of tea, Mrs. McClaskey? No, 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 I've put you to enough trouble already. Oh, sure, it's no trouble. Honest, honestly, no. Anyway, he'll be done in a minute, and we'll be off. He's very tired. Oh, look, here they come, the way. <laughs> well, uh, he should sleep now. Just need to keep that temperature down. I'll give you a prescription. Oh, Angela, this is my wife, Patricia. Oh, hello, Mrs. McCluskey. I'm Angela McCluskey. Oh, pleased to meet you. Oh, my bag. I left it upstairs. Patricia, could you... No, I'll get it. Please, let me. You've been through enough for one night. The top of the stairs. That house gone. What about it? When I went upstairs, there were five beds, all in one tiny room. All clean and tidy, but not an inch to swing a cat in. And no sign of a bathroom. So? I knew that some people lived like that. Of course I did. But I'd never seen it for myself. The poverty. When I was in Glasgow during the war, organising housing for evacuees, I never came across conditions like that, even in the Gorbals. I'll try any of the tenements. Northland Road. There's eight families to a house and one toilet between them. It's all the same in that part of Dungannon. High rent, poor conditions. But that's, that's awful. I know. Put your foot down, love. I'm done in. Angela. Thanks. Oh, you know what I mean. Tired looking. Well, you can be sure it wasn't from a night of passion. What with Mama sleeping in the next room? Cahill again? Oh, poor wee mighty. Had us up all night. Had to get the doctor. It's that house. You and Tommy having to share a small house for your mother and sisters. You'll have to get out of it. For Cahill's sake, at least. Don't I know it? We all have to get out of them. Rabbit hutches, that's all they're good for, them houses. Mm. Morning, ladies. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Hi Michelle. What's up with you? Nick! What? What's wrong with your hat? <laughs> oh my god, a rat! A gift! Oh, oh Michelle, let's go! Let's let go! Oh, the Danny chews it himself! I don't think I'm stupid! Oh, <laughs> Michelle, come out at lunchtime. We'll do a bit of window shopping. Get a few things for your bottom drawer. Oh, yeah, I suppose we'll have to get in the way of being a housewife. Looking at curtains and carpets and stuff. Getting all grown up. <laughs> god, your life will change now, all right, girl. How did you mean? What about you and Danny look at each other? I'd say you'd be pregnant by Christmas. I can't leave her off. Just what we need in this town. More we Protestants. <laughs> ah, better be off, love. I have a new secretary starting this morning. That right? Fine looking woman too. Not sure our marriage is safe. Go to work, Con. You're not jealous? Go to work. Hey. What's up? Look, I'm sorry about last night. All that talk about America. I just let it all get on top of me. Anyway, I have to go. It's not about that. What? How do you do that, Con? Do what? Look at you, breezing up as if last night hadn't happened. That house, that child living in those conditions. Is this about Ann Street? Doesn't it make you angry? What good does anger do? I see things and I just have to put them behind well, me. Well, I don't have to. What? That house, I have never seen anything like that. And you tell me that you see that every day. Yes, yes, I see it. I watch people living like that. It doesn't mean to say that I don't care, but I'm a doctor, Patricia. A doctor, not a bloody politician. Oh. I just love this place. All these beautiful curtains. Look at these. Do you ever see the like? If you had your choice, Michelle, what would you pick? Mm. Mm, I think I'd... Go for those lovely velvet ones. Gorgeous, mm. that is. Hey, you're Tommy working here today. Hmm. I mean, he's probably featuring about in the storeroom. Think he'd knock something off for us? <laughs> oh, sure he would. <laughs> See you. You're so lucky, Angela. Been able to get stuff cheap and all. Me? Sure, where'd I put it? Be a different matter when I get a house in my own. Sure, I'd have it lovely. Oh, these oh. sort of red ones. That'll be my choice. Hey! Don't be touching what you can't afford. <laughs> <laughs> you, you idiot. You're putting my heart across me there, Tommy. Oh, that's swell for you girls taking your ease. It's our lunch break. Can't work all the time. Here you're going to be a child bride, Michelle. Congratulations. <laughs> News travels fast. And even more congrats are due. Look, 
here in the newspaper. No. See, there you are. You and Danny are on the list. Let me see that. You've got a house. What? I never thought we'd hear so quickly. I'm really pleased for you, Michelle. Uh, congratulations. Isn't it great? Brilliant. <laughs> Take it easy, Ozzy. You're afraid of my customers away. Look at this. Why? Tell me why. Why is it that some slip of a girl packing out curtains while Susie, me and so many others were married with children and we're still waiting for a house? Angela. There is no justice in it. That's what I can't accept. Look, I'll go on turning up to the council, trying to get you a place of your own, Angela. But justice? <laughs> Don't look for that. There's none of that to be had here. Not for the likes of us. But we'll just have to keep trying. I just want a house. Mrs. McCluskey. Uh, Mrs. McChrystal. Angela. Oh, please pardon the intrusion. Sure. It's uh, just, I came to see... How's Carl? Oh, he's much better. Thanks. Oh, I'm glad. Do you want to come in, Mrs. McCluskey? No, no. I just wanted to say... To offer... Angela, if there is anything I can do... I... I... I don't oh, think... here's your husband. I'll leave you now. Hello, Mr. McChrystal. Oh, Mrs. McCluskey. What did she want? I don't know. But she's a decent woman, I'd say. Not many like her come down here to the likes of us. Ooh, good shot there, Father. Not uh, bad for a beginner. Uh, it's not easy, this putting, but uh, <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> ah, you have a grand sight here, Carl. Overlooking the town. It's beautiful. It is, isn't it? Look, I don't know where Patricia's got to. Do we want another drink? Well, uh... Sorry, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, I'm, no, Father. I'm glad you've arrived, Patricia. I'm afraid I'm not a good putter. Uh, bridge now. That's another matter. Where were you? I went down to Ann Street to see that boy, Cahal McChrystal. Why? Patricia, will, will you take over? I, I'm really no good at this game. I'm going inside. But we're in the middle of a game, Patricia. I said... Look, I... we're just trying to enjoy this beautiful... What? Isn't it, Patricia? I said we're just and trying to enjoy... And isn't that just the problem? Isn't it exactly? What are you talking about? We're up here enjoying our evenings. And down there in the town, down there below us, those slums, Angela and all of them, only half a mile away. Look, I can't pretend this isn't happening anymore. It, it's just a... Active life here, Patricia. You know that. Catholic councillors giving out Catholic houses and, and Protestant councillors giving out Protestant houses. It's how it's always been. But there are no Catholic houses to give out now. That's the point. I know, I know. But with time. I, I'm not saying it's right or fair. But question that and there'll be trouble. There'll be people only too willing to exploit all that. And, and you know where that would lead. Right, Sheila. Down a minute. Damn, damn, damn. Well, so much for that, then. Oh, sorry, love. Look, I'll be right back. Oh, the mood's gone right off me. Angela. Well, it has. Look, this is just ridiculous. Here's us two married people with a child, and we can't even... We can't even... I know, love. I know. Well, I've had about enough of this. I'm going to do something about it. What? I don't know, but something. There must be something. What's this? What's it look like? <laughs> what do you want an exercise book for? No, nah, it's what we want it for. We? Look, if our own councillors can't or won't do anything for us, then we'll do it for ourselves. Uh, do what? Look, Susie, I've got this idea. We'll knock on all the doors in Ann Street. Every Catholic house in Dundalman, Shh, we'll knock on the doors. Shh, just behind you. Right, OK. Now, let's get organised. I want to know who's living where, for how long, and what they're paying in rent. How many years they've been on the waiting list. We'll record the whole lot in this book. But, Angela, you'll just get us into trouble. Susie, 
Love, you've already got trouble. Three years you and Paul have been married. Have you spent more than a week under the same roof? You can't even live with your husband because there just isn't the room. Look, Susie, trust me. It's the only way we'll ever get anything done. Even McMaster can't argue with the facts. Oh, Angela, I, I don't know. It's our only way. Here, Susie. Oh, you can take it all down. Please. You were always the writer and speller. Jim! Jim, wait a minute. Ah, they're up the green flag round, my men. Oh, so you're coming to the meeting now? We are not. Look, we got a letter from McMaster, signed by the sex of us. Well, why? Reminding him of the nationalist position on the constitutional situation of the six counties. <laughs> He'll be shaking in his shoes. Hey, listen. What's that? Yeah, you're all very welcome, gentlemen. Uh, now, before we convene this meeting, I, I, I think I should, uh, where's, uh, what on earth is that commotion outside? Raymond, have a look out the window, will you? Well, well, there's something going on in the town square. You'd better take a look, Mr. McMaster. If it's not one thing, it's another in this town. What? Well, what's that band doing in our town square? It's a crowd of women and children. Crowds? Placards? A band? What on earth is all this? Some sort of deputation? A mob, Raymond. A mob. That's what it is. Well, they're not coming in here. No, sir. Raymond, take a few of the boys down there and see they don't get up the steps. Let them see who's running this town. Great, Susie. Everybody, keep together, keep together. Hold those placards higher. They'll have to take notice of this now. Oh, look up there. See him, McMaster, looking out of the window. And look at the oil face on him. And look, there's some of his cronies at the top of the steps. They're not going to let us in. Well, we're not going to stand for that, are we? No chance. We're going to make them listen to us. Come on. Come on, Come on everyone. The homeless. Hold the placards higher. Justice for young married couples. Justice, justice for young married couples! <coughs> Don't move! Let us, let us you let us can't in. all come in here! Uh, Go back no. down the steps! Uh, Go back or we'll call the police! Would you stop? Quit pushing! We have a petition! We demand to be heard! Angela, give me the give me the petition! Oh, I'll take it in! Good man, Jim! Oh, you're not about to fill it! Oh, would you yeah. take your hands off me? Yeah, would you dare yeah. push me down the steps? Yeah, 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 the ship to Little Rock! Discrimination! So you see, in that exercise book is information that should shame this council. In it is recorded how many families are in each house, how long the people have been married, what they're paying in rent, it, because they are paying rent, even for the hovels they're living in. Have a read, gentlemen. You won't believe it, or maybe you will. For now, they're only asking for one thing that every member of the council, both nationalist and unionist, attend a special meeting in two days' time to hear the views of the people. And we demand that you all be present. Uh, biggest crowd we've ever had, actually. The unionists better come. You think they'll come? Especially McMaster? They've had plenty of notice. <clears throat> Where the hell is he? Look, he'll turn up. They all will. You women really laid it in the line. They can't ignore that summons. They'll come. I bet none of them will come. Look, I'm telling you, they'll be here. That's it. They're not coming. They're 40 minutes late already. Susie, they will. They'll have to. I didn't fizz in them. Us collecting all that stuff. None of them. Not even our own councillors. They've all ignored us. We've wasted our time. We may as well give up. No. I'm sorry, but that can't be right. What's she doing here? Mrs McCluskey. You can't give up. Not after so much hard work. And people's hopes being dashed again. In 20 years, no one's challenged them. And those that could, that should. We just stood back and did nothing. Now is the time to prove that you won't be beaten. You won't be fobbed off. You take the battle to them again and again until they're forced to listen. 
We should have a name so they know who they're dealing with. Get ourselves organised. Divide responsibilities and be sure the council has nothing on us. Get permission for every march, every meeting. Dress smartly. Everything above board. Everything within the law. That's the way to do it. They would love to depict us as wild troublemakers. You've a lovely house here. Pardon? It's gorgeous. You could fit my place into your living room. Beautiful. And you've a lovely garden. I'd love a wee garden. Yes, we're very lucky. We're very comfortable here. Angela, what happened tonight? You've started something. You know that, don't you? I hope we have. When I said if there was anything I could do, I think I can. I want to. Mr. McMaster. Hmm? Ah! Uh, Mrs. McChrystal, isn't it? How was your meeting? We managed without you. Aye, we did, we did. Oh, Mrs. McCluskey. I didn't see you there. To, to what do we owe this? <laughs> Spare uh... me the niceties, Mr. McMaster. I'm not here as the doctor's wife. Myself and these other ladies have come to introduce ourselves. The Committee of the Homeless Citizens League. I don't quite understand. Oh, but you will, Mr. McMaster. You soon will. We'll be picketing the next meeting of the Council, and the one after that, if necessary. We're on your back, and we'll be there until there are Catholic houses all over Dungannon. Have a nice day. Hi, Angela. Hi, Michelle. Want to hand me your packing? Oh, no, we're fine. You know, it's such a shame. These prefabs are palaces to what I'm living in. Indoor toilet, a bathroom, the space in your kitchen. To think of them just left lying empty when you all move out to the Killingman Road. Oh, no, who told you that? They won't be lying empty. The council's going to knock them all down. What? Sell them off as hen houses or something. Are you all right, Angela? You've gone as wet as a sheet. And McMaster confirmed it? Yes. I went straight to his house. He made a joke of it. Right. We take this to the very top. I'm going to ring Joe Stewart. It's about time the leader of the Nationalist Party in Stormont should know about what's going on here. Let's call a meeting in the parish hall. The time has come to share our council's dirty little secret with the world. I have here three letters. One to the British ambassador in Dublin one to 10 Downing Street, and one to the Council of Europe. And we'll go on writing letters, holding up placards, taking this higher and wider, until there's not a person alive doesn't know what's going on in this town. And of course, last but not least, we sent a copy of our petition to Joe Stewart up in Stormont. Now, let's see if he can get any action from the Minister of Housing. Yeah. to the question tabled by the leader of the Nationalist Party, I have received from Dungannon Town Council the information he requested. The estate of prefabricated houses he refers to has been designated a slum area, and as such the council intends to clear it for redevelopment. May I respectively point out to the housing minister that Furman Park is very far from a slum. Proof of that? Every proof. In this document here, compiled by a respected citizen of the town, Mrs. Patricia McCluskey and our Homeless Citizens League. Yes! <laughs> Give those houses to the homeless minister. That is not in my power. Of course it is. Who's power? Is it? it is fair to say that as far as that particular council is concerned, there are certain people who want to live in certain areas. Oh, and let us be frank story. about it. We know that is so, even in the city of Belfast. It just so happens that the houses being completed at this stage are in a particular area. <laughs> but there are other houses to follow which are in a different area. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Mr. McMaster, I hear there'll be a big crowd coming to the council meeting tonight. Oh, you can bet on it. They've had their hour up at Stormont yesterday, but they'll see tonight that I'm well able for them. Well able. 
I assure you, I'm very happy to consider the idea of a change of use for the prefabs. But unfortunately, I'm bound by the Council's previous resolution on the subject. We're not talking about changing the British Constitution. Look, I can categorically say there will be more houses built in the Nationalist Ward. How can you expect me to believe a word you're saying when you haven't built a house for a Catholic family in more than three decades? I'm saying we will. When? They need homes now. In good time, Mrs McCluskey. All in good time. Now, um, other business? He's burning up. What is it, Doctor? Pneumonia. Come on. I'm taking him straight to hospital. Let's get him out of here. You'll never be right living here. You need a house of your own. First fresh air, he's had a week. Poor wee mite. Ah, he's a new fella since he's come out of the hospital. Well, there goes the last of the removal vans. Look at those prefabs. It's a disgrace, so it is. Perfectly good houses, bathrooms, inside toilets. Our wee cattle wouldn't know himself in one of those. I think McMaster will let us have them. Him? Never. But it'd take a... Wait a minute. What? Look. There are the front doors. What about them? You see the keys. They've left them in the doors for the housing officer to collect. So? Wait here. Angela, where are you going? Angela! Ah, well struck, Minister. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> have you played here before? Ah, no, never. Uh, I'm a member of Dungarran. Ah, oh, you must come up to Belfast more often. I thought you'd like this. Thought it'd be an ideal location for our little private chat. Oh, yeah. yes, indeed, Minister. The thing is, we are anxious to tie this up now, this business with the Homeless Citizens League. Bring it to a close. That McCluskey woman is chalking up more column inches with every passing day. To be honest, I'm sick of the sight of her in the papers. Oh, I'm with you there, Minister. Of course I am. But we can't stop her. She doesn't need us. Maybe not. But the McChrystal woman, she wants a house so much, give her a house. Pardon, Minister? You're shot, Edward. Who's that? Oh, it's all right. I'll get it. Oh. Susie! Congratulations. What? Here. Seen the paper? The housing list got what you wanted, didn't you? You got yourself a house. Me? We're having a meeting about it down in the hall. Come in. Nice and cosy, isn't it, Angela? One for you and one for your mammy. Susie, you don't even know what you're talking about. Mammy hasn't put in for a house. We're really disappointed in you, Angela. Stop this. Stop it. Can't you see what's going on here? Divide and rule. That's why McMaster's done this. Well, whatever it is. You've got a house now, Angela. And that'll be it. Whether you like it or not, you were our backbone. Without you, we're nothing. I won't take it. What? Of course I won't. If I did, I'd be saying their way of doing things is fair. No, I'll never take a house. Not until every one of us has got a house by rights. Angela, look. Anyway, I've got a better idea. Look here. What's this? The keys for every house in Fairmont Park. Where'd you get them? They were left in the doors. I just tucked them, made copies. We're flying now. What do you mean? I mean... We squat in the prefabs. Squat? Yeah, take possession of them and not come out until they give us houses of our own. Are you sure, Angela? You think it'll work? Can't you see their eye faces? <laughs> no, no! It would be breaking the law. It's not the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. We've done everything else. We've written letters, protested, carried placards, picketed the council offices. Look, everybody, up to now, we've done everything by the book got permission for our marches, all within the law. No one can criticise us. And it's all come to nothing. This is a stunt, Angela. The parades, the risks we've all taken with our homes and families. If any of this is going to make a lasting difference, this has to be more than a quick smash and grab. We're fighting here for something bigger. We're fighting for social justice. Social justice. Well, you might be Mrs McCluskey. The rest of us just want a place to live. Look, it's now or never. The bulldozers are coming tomorrow to knock the whole lot down. Let's put it to the vote. 
Everyone in favour of squatting, raise your hands. It was a vote, Patricia. You didn't make the decision. But they listened to me. I told them it has to be unanimous. They all squat or nobody does. They'd be breaking the law. They were right to listen to you. It could only bring trouble. They think you're right. And what do you think? Uh, I don't know. But how can you start setting society right with the wrong? If we break the law now, what example is that to set for the young ones that are coming after us? So what are you going to do? Nothing. People are just too frightened. And what about our house? We have to take that house, Angie. I can't do that. You know I can't. I don't know any such thing. Look, I promised. And what about the others? What about them? But they're not your family, Angie. Tommy, it's not a They're case not of your weather. son, your husband. Listen to that. But we've just got to get out of here. I want that house, Angela. Cahill needs it. We've just got to get a house. You know something? You're absolutely right. Angela, what's wrong? Fancy a trip out, Susie? Come on, bring your coat. We might be some time. It's 11 o'clock, for goodness sake. And in exactly 12 hours time, the bulldozers will be knocking down Fermont Park. We've got to move now. You mean squat? But the vote? Oh, to hell with the vote. It's now or never. If we don't go now, it'll be too late. Come on, we're going round the others up. Colin? What? Colin, they're in Fairmont Park. They're what? Angela's just off the phone. She's got a few families to move into the prefabs overnight. But the vote? They must have changed their minds. Anyway, it's the talk of the town, she says. And somebody's tipped off the papers. She says there's reporters everywhere and TV cameras. Well, who knows, maybe this is a cause for a celebration. Mr McMaster. I take it you have heard about the squatters in the prefabs in Fermont Park. Who hasn't? A disgraceful act of self-promotion and lawlessness, which I hope every right-thinking person will see fit to condemn, as I presume you yourself do, Mr Corrigan. Those women have been plunged into depression, even made suicidal, by the hopeless situation they find themselves and their families in. They are there now, setting up home in these prefabs, and there they intend to stay. What do you propose to do about it? Oh, there's plenty we propose to do about it, Mr Corrigan. The Housing Committee will recommend court proceedings to be taken against all illegal occupiers of council property. Shame! No legal action will be taken against any persons who leave before a set deadline. However, those squatters who do remain will never in the future be considered for rehousing by this council. I think that should settle matters down. Uh, wouldn't you say so, Mr Corrigan? I had to do it, Mrs McCluskey. It isn't right. I know that. I know how we voted. But I just couldn't let them knock down perfectly good houses, now could I? And of course I'll be collecting rent. Everyone's agreed on that. To show them we're not homeless because we haven't got the money. We've all got jobs. We've all paid rent. Higher than the council's asking. Are you annoyed? It is against the law. I know. So. I know. What? You know, sometimes, Angela, to be middle class is a terrible handicap. Anyway, the families are in now. But how on earth are they going to stay here? Who knows? We've got a sort of barricade at the entrance to the estate. More symbolic than anything else. Here, I've written to the minister, William Morgan and copies to all the papers, asking him to leave you be. Oh, that's great! The more publicity, the better. Wait a minute. There's something going on out there. What is it? McMaster, with four men from the council. Mrs McCluskey, what a surprise. I didn't realise you were in need of accommodation. Mr McMaster. I didn't realise you had a sense of humour. Oh, 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 I don't understand your antagonism, Mrs McCluskey. After all, you and I, we're cut from the same cloth. We've struggled to make something of ourselves, of this town. Let's face it, under different circumstances, you'd be standing next to me. I don't think so. 
Are you really going to allow... I, I mean, look, there's political ambition in these people. In fact, I smell the Republicans at work here. Yes, they're the answer to everything, aren't they? Wouldn't you just love that? But these people don't care about politics. They don't want to hear about flags or constitutions or the border. Uh -huh. They just want houses. Yes. Yes. As a Christian, let them say, Mr. McMaster, the people here, all I want is a decent place to live. Well, what yes. you ask yes. is not in my gift, Mrs. McChrystal. You are trespassing on council property. Oh. You have broken the law. And you'll be breaking the law if you try and put them out. This isn't the Wild West, Mr. McMaster. You want rid of the squatters? Then talk to your lawyer. Oh, I will. Don't you worry about that. This matter will go before the next petty sessions. We'll see you there. One month and you're all out. Oh, you're you're see you in the court court the car. What? Oh, Colin. Jim, it's, uh, it's you. You've been down to the prefabs then? We have. We're going back there now. Come with us, Father. Take a look yourself. Should the Lord be in need of some spiritual comfort? Put in an appearance. Up their morale a bit. Oh, I, I would. I will. Look, Father, if Christ himself was on earth now, he would at least have gone to see those squatters. Do you know who I'd forgotten? Jew back in the house for a parish meeting. Uh, but next week, yes. Uh, Hi. Can you tell him I'll be coming? <laughs> I'll put the wind up him all right. Come on down, Jim. Let's give them some support, even if the clergy can't or won't. Well, how do you think we're doing? Oh, isn't it good to see everybody settling in? Just like normal. Like it should be. Though I hear no one else will squat. Not until Morgan's made his decision whether we can stay or not. That's why this meeting is so important. Typical, isn't it? We started all this, but it's the men that get the trip up to Stormont. Where were they earlier? I know, I know. But we've got one chance with this. We need the minister to take it seriously. To know this isn't just a mother's meeting. It still sticks in my craw. Mine too, but we need the men now. Hello, ladies. Saddle them, I see. No thanks to you lot. Look, Angela, uh, we've been having a discussion. And the nationalist representatives have clubbed together. And here's a cheque for £200. Just to help out a bit. Well, you know what you Keep can... it. We don't need money. We need houses. It's easy to write a cheque. We'd have preferred your presence when you were needed. Taking his time, isn't he? We're here 20 minutes. You think he's forgotten? Oh, he'll not forget. This is big news now. The minister has to be seen to give us a hearing. Anyway, he can't just ignore me as the leader of the Nationalist Party. And you think he'll accept our petition? Oh, he'll have to. But it's how he acts afterwards that counts. And what if he does nothing, then what? We chain ourselves to the railings outside Parliament and stay there until he does. <laughs> I'm not joking. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that, Colin. Ah, at last. Gentlemen. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. I trust you had a pleasant drive up from Dungannon. Oh, pleasant enough, thank you, Minister. Uh, do take a seat, please. Uh, now... What is it uh, I can do for you? Uh, Minister, let me introduce you to Dr. Con McCluskey, a prominent supporter of the Homeless Citizens League. How do you do, Doctor? Pleased to meet you, Minister. Of course, your name is familiar to me. I believe your wife is the driving force behind the League. She's one of the many, Minister. Indeed. It's uh, such an unfortunate situation we have there at the moment. Very unfortunate indeed. Well... We're hoping that our meeting today will go some way to resolving matters. Well, yes, of course, anything I can do. But first and foremost, I must point out that the ultimate responsibility for housing in Dungannon rests with the Urban District Council. It's important we all understand that. Oh, we understand it all too well. That, in a nutshell, is the problem. What precisely do you mean, Dr McCluskey? Well, with what... respect, Minister... Rather than, than, than get into our well-rehearsed arguments about the unrepresentative nature of the council, I propose we stick with the immediate issues. Which are? Over the past fortnight, 37 families comprising 126 people, who include 67 children, mostly under five years of age, have moved into the empty prefabs in Fermont Park. Now, I'm aware of that, Mr Stewart, but... Uh, well, surely, I... Minister, the fact that these people are willing, indeed delighted 
to move into houses the council has earmarked for slum clearance speaks volumes for the conditions that they are presently living in. Well, And I... the council is currently making plans to affect these people. But, Mr Stewart, as I said, the sole responsibility for housing... All we're asking at this stage is that those people be allowed to stay there until they get new permanent houses of their own. I repeat, that decision rests solely... It would with... ease tension greatly if they could stay. Is that too much to ask? Furthermore, Minister, Dungannon Council has had enough bad publicity as it is. Can you imagine what effect the forcible eviction of 126 men, women and children would look like? And what effect it would have? This is the television age, Minister. Those pictures would go around the world. Dungannon would be linked with Alabama. Yes, and all of this can be so easily avoided, Minister. So you met the deputation, Minister? I did, Edmund. And how did they acquit themselves? They uh, made their case. <laughs> Such as it was. Such as it was. Exactly. <laughs> what did I say, Minister? Troublemakers, the whole lot of them, hell-bent on stirring up the passions of the unthinking and ill-educated. Strange you should say that. Strange? Yeah. They said exactly the same thing about your council. <laughs> oh, they'd say anything, those people. Do anything for publicity. That's certainly true. Uh, uh, pardon, Minister? It seems they've made all sorts of influential contacts in London, Washington, New York. Anywhere you care to name, in fact. Indeed, I believe the American ambassador to Ireland will shortly be calling on your Mrs. McCloskey. The American ambassador? No less a one. <laughs> See? Stop but nothing. Yes, hey, you're right. Yeah. Certainly not doing the image of this little province of ours any good. Well, that's what it's all about. If you want my opinion, that and attracting attention to themselves. Perhaps so. But anyway, Edward, you yourself have become something of a famous man lately. Been attracting a lot of attention to yourself one way or another. Thank you, Minister. Did I say that was a compliment? But, Minister, surely you're not serious. I need to go into details, Mr. McMaster. But after consultation, we've drawn up details of a three-point agreement in this letter. Allow me to read it to you. Dear Dr. McCluskey... Since, since you, you brought, brought the deputation the to see me, I have been in touch with Mr. McMaster and settled on a three-point agreement. One, Dungannon Council will be building new houses in the Nationalist Ward as a matter of urgency. Two... Squatters who cooperate with the council will then be fully eligible for these new houses. new houses. Three. In the meantime, I can state publicly that the squatters are free to stay in Fairmount Park until the council is in a position to rehouse them. Dr. McCluskey, uh, sorry for interrupting your celebrations. Uh, I'm from the people. Doing a story on the Dungannon affair. An English journalist? Don't see many of them around here. Just want to congratulate you. Oh, no, you're talking to the wrong person. It was the women did this. The women and nobody else. Women like my wife here. We did nothing. We changed nothing. What? Angela and the others are allowed to stay on in the prefabs, and I'm grateful for that. Well, surely, Mrs. McCluskey, what you've done, all of you, well, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't significant, you won, Mrs. McCluskey. The small person's victory over officialdom and prejudice. That's the story I'm writing. Then don't. What? They bought us off with a few houses, that's all. But that's what it was all about, wasn't it? It's a sticking plaster on a mortal wound. Can I quote that? We didn't win, but we started something. And that's the important bit. And we'll go on fighting for social justice. It's not me you should be talking to. I just joined the bandwagon once it was rolling. Ah, but Patricia, you were I... central... I was a follower, nothing more. The one you should be talking to is Angela McChrystal. Angela McChrystal. You see, he hasn't even heard of her. Well, name is familiar. It was Angela who refused to be cowed, refused to be humiliated, refused to be treated as less than equal. She's the one you should be writing about. Ever heard of Rosa Parks? Wasn't she something to do with the Alabama bus boycott in 1955? Something? She was the Alabama bus boycott. Arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white man. Of course, I remember. Well, we have our own Rosa Parks. Our Dungannon Rosa Parks. Put that in your paper.
Well, I did get a new house eventually. I was the last to be given one. And I was happy. I wanted nothing more. It was all I ever wanted. I had no real interest in politics, apart from community issues. But I watched all the developments that followed from our simple demands for fur treatment. Patricia and Khan went on to found the Campaign for Social Justice and five years later, in 1968, the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association was formed. And the rest is history. But some still remember. For before the peace process, before the Anglo-Irish Agreement, before Blur and Ahern, before Hume and Adams, before Trimble and Malin, before all of them, it was the women of Dungannon who stood up for what was right. That was Dungannon, which was adapted for radio by John P. Rooney from a screenplay by Chris Neal. Angela was played by Susan Lynch, Patricia by Stella McCusker, Con by Jared McSorley, and Susie by Nikki Doherty. McMaster was James Ellis, Raymond Kieran Lagan, Jim Connor Grimes, Morgan Gordon Fulton, Michelle Sheila O'Kean, and Tommy. James Doran. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Dungannon was directed in Belfast by Stephen Wright. Friends, family, ladies and gentlemen. It's ten minutes to twelve, Godfrey. Uh, just dressing. A few short words. Never exactly having been known to win prizes for my speech-making, but having won here today the finest prize a man could ever... Stupefaction guaranteed. Whew, two roses. Happiest man alive, you. As you cast your mind back over these past three headlong years. It's not the drowning man thing at all, actually. It's just the opposite. Far from it all flashing before my eyes, I feel as if I'm seeing the whole affair in slow motion. Maybe I'm dehydrating. That would account for it. All that gin last night. The happiest dehydrating man alive. How has it ended up with you in the spotlight? Given that people often forget you're actually there, most especially when they're talking to you. But then since people only ever talk to themselves anyway, most of them, just like you here and now, for instance... Oh, Jesus... I know what you're secretly wishing. You're wishing that he would turn up. Mahoney, the ghost at the wedding feast. So, may I take this opportunity of saying, as a congenital bystander of very long standing, that I'm no different from all you other voyeurs, lusting for somebody rash and ill-advised to create an incident. And let's give George his due. He treated the whole bunch of us to a downright bloody major international sensation of sorts. Him and his map. Oh, fair's fair. It was me who put him on to Victoria, after all. Very civil of you, Godfrey. Not that it mattered. He would have gone to see her on his own. Regardless. Well, I feel a bit less daft with you here to introduce me. She does think it's intriguing, though, George. Is that a fact? Oh, I think so. 
So what did she say exactly? Well, what she really said, of course, was that, uh, that you know, she couldn't really say... Of course, anything of course. ...anything definite yet, naturally enough, till she's had a proper chance, you know. Of course not. But she does think it's intriguing. Good, good, good. I, uh, known her long, have you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. O Oxford. Oxford, is that a fact? The pair of you actually used to work in the motor industry, then? Yeah, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Same college, I mean. <laughs> Just kidding, Godfrey. Just kidding. Well, she must be quite a high flyer running a big map department like this. She certainly is that all right. Her credentials are quite awesome. I see. The Earth Mother type. There's very few can touch her in the field of historical cartography. As big as that, mm -hmm. huh? You know, it's always puzzled me as to why the word Bristol's is old-fashioned slang for the female titular appendages. Now, would historical cartography embrace a query of that ilk, say? Nothing to do with Bristol cream, perhaps. Awesome, now, maybe she'd just leave the book on her desk here and call back later. No, 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 she knows we're coming. She's probably just been briefly waylaid in the stacks. We should all be so lucky. Something of that sort. Incidentally, uh, sorry I've had no luck yet in finding a place to keep. Oh, there's no hurry, George, really. The minute I find somewhere... Really, have the room for as long as you need it. Sure? Really. Very decent of you, Godfrey. Funny enough, I'm very deficient myself, as far as maps go. Is that a fact? Yeah, <laughs> rather like being tone deaf, I suppose. Come to think of it, I am tone deaf. So it's probably all the same bit missing. But what it means, though, is my brain refuses to make the leap from the page to the landscape. <laughs> like everything else, Godfrey, it requires an act of faith. I do appreciate all the lines of stitching and the little crucifixes and triangles and so on in their own right. It, it's just that when I straighten up, they simply refuse to translate themselves into railway lines and churches and altitudes. <laughs> What's worse is I always need the road on the map to be facing the same way as the actual road I'm standing on, <laughs> which generally entails turning the thing sideways on. And then, of course, you can't read the place names anyway. <laughs> so how did you come to teach geography? To... Oh, no, that, that was all academic. My doctoral thesis was the definitive study of azimuthal projections. There's not many can say that. <laughs> not many would admit to it. Listen, Godfrey. I, for one, have often wondered about asimuthal projections. Oh, I doubt that, George. About what it is that really lies behind them. Geometry. Boredom. Come on, educate no, me. No, no, really. I'm interested, I am. Ah, I can't. Out with it, come on. Oh, God. Uh, let's see. Asimuthal projections. Say you construct a plane at a tangent to either one of the two poles. Oh, I'm rather good at that, you'll have noticed, going off on a tangent. I've noticed. <laughs> anyway, as you probably know, a completely accurate map of the world is an impossibility, because every possible method of projection incurs a different form of distortion. <laughs> Stands to reason. So, at any rate, in this particular case, here we are with the two poles. Ah. Well, Godfrey. Victoria. Hello. Here you are, then. If you want me to give another lecture, forget it. I'm still being played by that little Welshman of yours. Oh, no, no, no. Not Mr. Reese. He keeps popping in to explain how the Carthaginians came from another planet. Oh, Lord, not that. He's actually a monumental mason, you know. Also, how they built Stonehenge. Come think of it. I don't believe I've seen you since I was made director. Mod off. Oh, same old thing. Extramural studies. What happened to Burke? Is it Burke? Dead and buried, I'm afraid. Perhaps I mean her. Uh, no, no, no. Berkeley, I mean. Dr. Berkeley. You know how he used to drink tea non-stop? Quite. Although I've never heard of it actually proving fatal. Uh, no, no, no. It was the electric kettle, the plug, killed outright. Oh, well. Well, congratulations. Yeah, um, I wonder if I might perhaps... If you remember me mentioning George. Hello there. George Mahoney, Victoria Pratt. The St. Brendan gentleman. Aye. And you're the uh, old map lady? I've taken a look at this ancient chart you say you found, it would appear to prove that America was discovered by the Irish. You mean it was ever in doubt? Is cartography a hobby of yours? Well, to tell the truth, I always imagined it was something to do with playing cards. The art of fortune-telling, maybe. Huh? Cardography. Guesswork may be occasionally involved, but we do draw the line at clairvoyance. What would your guess be in this case, though? That you're a practical joker. Oh, and not guilty, Miss Pratt. As Godfrey as my judge. Well, I was standing there right on the spot when George made the discovery. Very well. Suppose you tell me about yeah, it. Yes, right. Well, it was inside this book. Navigatio Sancti Brendani. The Voyage of St. Brendan. Hell of a good read. Are you acquainted with it? 
It's the medieval romance which has him paddling across the Atlantic in a coracle. Do you read a lot of Latin prose? It was translated for me by a brother. Incidentally, it's not a coracle, by the way. The word is actually cura. Coracles are Welsh, aren't they? Small, round sort of baskets. Aye, half the like Mr. Reese, in fact. The cura is the long Irish sea-going boat. My mistake. Nevertheless, I'm afraid I don't have much time for tall tales and folk legends. You see, that's just where you and Christopher Columbus part company, Flora. Oh, oh, dear. Your book appears to have been vandalised at some point. Too right. Last Tuesday, it was pillaged by a four-year-old Viking. Uh, Ragnar Nielsen's brat, actually. That's how the map came to light. I see. You remember, Ragnar, biology, pigtails? No, but let's pretend yes. It's only that she called in, you see, with the petition about the departmental crash. So while we were talking, a toddler wandered into my spare room. He's a brawny little fellow. And by the time she went to fetch him, he had George's book in bits and pieces all over the floor. Published 1649. It survives Cromwell, Napoleon, the Irish famine, two world wars. Only to fall victim to progressive parenthood. But with a book dismembered like that, we were able to spot the map. It was bound right into the spine. You can see the stitch marks just along there. It seems to have been drawn with the east at the top instead of north. You really need to turn it sideways on. Ireland and Britain are clear enough. Mm. Iceland? Uh, Greenland, presumably. Ah, it's, uh, it's these blobs over here that are so titillating. Indeed. It's quite clearly a crude rendition of Newfoundland, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and Nova Scotia, all round that way. There's only one thing missing. What's that, Victoria? There's no X to mark the spot where the treasure's buried. Uh, uh, but... Yes. Yes. <sighs> Tell us this, Godfrey. Can Miss Pratt sing and do impressions as well? How it got itself bound into your book, Mr Mahoney, I really can't say. But whoever drew this thing had a quaint sense of make-believe. It's actually dated 845 AD, which is 100 years older than the oldest surviving English map, even though we have not the slightest evidence of an early Irish cartographic tradition. He's drawn it in a style which doesn't otherwise appear before 1250. It's showing bits of North America, a century and a half before even the Vikings are supposed to have reached it, and a further five centuries before it makes an appearance on any other chart. So? Is that all you've got against it? I notice it also comes with a helpful caption. Terra Repromissionis Sanctorum. Uh, George says that was the Irish monk's name for the legendary paradise out in the ocean. The land promised to the saints. Canada? Well, you know God. Only by hearsay. Full of little pleasantries. I should know. I used to work for him. Oh, yes? In what capacity was that? Two years in County Curry as a Cistercian monk. Good God, George. You never mentioned that before. I uh, know, Godfrey, but it's... Well, it's like having a prison record. It makes people wonder about you. Is that where you got this book? It was a farewell presentation from the abbot and all the lads when I was leaving Artfert. Artfert? Didn't you say that that was where St Brendan had his monastery? Good for you, Godfrey. Aye. The Cistercians built their gaff on top of his original foundation. So the book actually came from this Artfert monastery? It came out of the library, yeah. Well, then. The map is clearly a doodle by some former monk amusing himself while he read the book. If so, why was it carefully hidden in the binding? Why is it drawn on vellum instead of paper? Why is this inscription in Old Irish? See? And why is there a love poem in 17th century Irish on the back? So, that's all you've got in its favour. Victoria has a lovely pair of Bristols. Do you read a lot of Old Irish? Not personally. I saw them once. I took it to the Department of Celtic Studies in the university. Just by accident. And? And the prof there was beside himself. Here we are, Albert. Here we are. Albert? <coughs> uh, not Albert. George. 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 Ah, these Anglo-Saxon names. Never mind. Uh, I made a photocopy. So I see. Because the gist I can certainly give you, I can easily give you the gist, but the Irish in this inscription has got some very archaic locutions, you know. Remarkable. 
I should like more time to tinker with it. I will just give me the gist anyway, just for now. Here we go, then. Uh, roughly as follows. I, Coleman of the Voyages, set down this true image of the Blessed Isles to the west in the year the Northmen put to the flames Great Clonmacnoise. Do we know what year that was? That year was 845 A.D., my friend. Well, uh, what about the poem on the back? Plain sailing. Colloquialised poetic diction, highly typical of the personal lyric in the 17th century. No, no problems there, George. So, how does it go? No, oh, I can't reproduce the metre, of course. As I said, I'm always happy to settle for the gist, Professor. Uh-huh, good man. Uh, stand by, uh, roughly as follows. It is well for the sea to shake its white mane. It is well for the wind and it howling. It is well for the young brides at singing. But I am forbidden a tongue to my love and my grief. That's verse one. Aye, very good. Giles Kemp of the blue-grey eye and strange talking. You are slow blossom and raven wing. You are red berries on a bank of snow. You are an English master of the English hounds. Thus is my most beloved, my bitterest foe. Thus is the sweetest name, the cruelest curse. Thus to aver my love is to lose my life. As the sun sinks, so does my heart. Hmm. Giles Kemp. An English soldier is my guess. An officer. I'd say it's a poem from a high-born Irish girl in love with an English officer. Not very politic. Certainly not in Cromwell's time, no. Any more than today. Because what she might have done, you see, was scribble her poem out on the back of the map parchment, secretly, and then hide it away in the book well out of harm's way. Just using up the blank sides of the vellum, you see, because the old map in those days was likely considered worthless. Monkish hieroglyphics. Fascinating. It is, uh, to put it mildly, a sensational find, Giles. No, uh, not Giles. George. George. Uh, Giles is in the poem, you see. Yeah, well, thanks for your help, Prof. Only too glad. Gurramila mahagot, slonagot. Gurramila mahagot, sir. Good day to slon. I can't deny its curiosity value. You're the expert, Victoria. So, I suggest we get them to run a few laboratory tests. That should clarify matters. Right you go. Well, I need to supply a urine sample. Funny that feeling you get. Fading away into anonymity. <sighs> now, shoes. So, let us all salute the true believers. I mean, it's they who always hold centre stage. It's also clear-cut for them. <clears throat> George proclaims his belief in yes. Victoria asserts her belief in no. And nobody even asks you what you believe, naturally. Since all you could say would be, uh, it depends what you mean by discover. It depends what you mean by America. It depends what you mean by believe. What I mean by believe, Dr. Dudley, is simply accepting the evidence. You look at the Inca legends of the fair-skinned alien visitors. You look at the stone carvings in Peru. It all points unmistakably towards one thing. Oh, what's that, Mr. Reese? The Carthaginians. Good God. You don't believe they discovered America on top of everything else? It's a historical certainty which I cannot but accept, Dr. Dudley. How did they manage to find the time? Time is not a dimension which bothered them particularly. I suppose space was more their line. You think I'm a harmless crank, don't you? Oh, certainly the Carthaginians were a remarkable people, Mr. Reese, on such scanty historical evidence as we possess. They'll be back soon, I reckon. Will they? Conditions are growing propitious for their return. Oh, that's nice. I could write you a little essay on it, if you like. Although my course is strictly speaking about map projections, you see. Oh, they were fully cognizant with all that sort of thing. Well, I think we might find that that's not altogether the case. You read my evidence, Dr. Dudley. 
That's all I ask. Well, I think well, you might. Uh, they didn't all return to their own planet, you know. Some of them stayed behind to keep a vigil. I'm afraid that's all I'm permitted to say at the moment. Oh. But then all beliefs are just as cuckoo. If you're looking in at them from the outside, that is. Some of you here today, of course, are very adept at being credulous. You can play every joker in the pack without the slightest qualm. I myself have never really acquired the knack somehow. What I find is the moment I hear somebody else expounding a point of view which I share, my belief in it begins to crumble. I've lost any little beliefs I ever had that way. Which is, of course, what makes you the perennial spare prick at a wedding. Though that's scarcely apropos in the immediate context. How goes it, Godfrey? Oh, you know, like a bare neck at a beheading. That's the spirit. Oh, you're so delectable, Victoria. That's the one belief I haven't lost. After 17 years of devoted lust, like some superb champagne that no one's ever really tasted. I just wish you wouldn't always offer me sherry when what I really want is a large gin. I don't really see what the problem is anyway. What if it does prove that the Irish discovered America? Why shouldn't they have? They seem to have sewn most of it up. Lucky for you, somebody discovered it. Not anymore. Sherry, Godfrey? Oh, uh... Mine is a large gin, since you ask. What do you mean? You're forever sending people out wrangling to those dude ranches and canoeing round the Rockies, etc. Oh, all that stuff's old hat now. They've seen too much television. No, they all want to mine for topaz in the Australian outback or go alligator spotting in Peru. Oh, searching for Carthaginians? Godfrey. Ah, Sherry. Much obliged. I don't know. I... Just can't keep up with people's fantasy lives any longer. Serves you right for offering them adventure holidays. I mean, really. How could anybody persuade themselves that adventure was a commodity to be purchased, ready-made? Oh, Christ, if you're going to start intellectualising again. I'm going to base Godfrey's joint for him. Hmm. Ah, he sounds like a bit of an odd fish, this Mahoney. He's Scottish. Where did you dig him up from? Curiously enough, it came about as a direct result of his interest in the SP. What the hell are you saying, Godfrey? That he got in touch by telepathy? Uh, well, not that I was aware of. He just wandered into my office one day, a few weeks back, to inquire about enrolling for a course. Psychology 17. Paranormal phenomena. Enough said? He was out of the usual run of extramural students, you know. Retired teachers and raving monomaniacs. He delivers yachts for a living. What's so unusual about that? I mean, he actually sells them to wherever the owner lives, across the ocean, that kind of delivery. He's just helped to deliver a trimaran from Panama for a man who manufactures artificial snow. God, I know any number of men who pay good money to have a go at that. I should think there's a special machine, does it? So where does he live? What, the artificial snowman? Ma... Only for Christ's sake. Oh, no, fixed abode. He roams round all the time, you see. He must occasionally sleep somewhere. Well, at the moment, I'm putting him up in the spare room. Ha! Huh. Just till he can find a decent short-term blit. In other words, he's a shiftless, bloody layabout. Talking politics again, I hear. This is my sister, Serena, George Mahoney. How are you? Fine, thanks. I hear you're an ex-monk. Guilty. That's pretty offbeat. Not particularly. It might be a bit different if I was an ex-nun. Drink, George. Thanks, Godfrey. What caused you to drop out? Sex. Just that. How much more do you need? The thing about monks and nuns is they always seem to have bad skin. Oh, well, it's on account of the habits. They give me the creeps. It's such a selfish life. In what way selfish? Concerned only with saving their own souls, contributing nothing to society. Serena runs a travel bureau, you we, see. Mm. We did a monastery tour a few years back, come to think of it. A kind of a tour. As far as I remember, it was a sort of imitation pilgrimage, you know, Chaucer and all that. 
small groups on horseback staying at the retreat houses. It was mostly France and Spain, but they were all agog about the Coptic monasteries in Ethiopia and Egypt. That was the ultimate in flash. These were religious groups? Oh, Christ, no. Some of them were in advertising. Just the usual lot, as far as I remember. You know, the business types, bureaucrats, bank officials. Serena's definition of ordinary people. Well, what's wrong with that? So long as they're all contributing something to society. They'll be sailing across the Atlantic in a wheelbarrow next. Did you say something, Godfrey? Uh, sorry, just a stray thought. You've managed to cling on to your faith in St. Brendan, at any rate. You make it sound like a favourite teddy bear. And is it? Victoria... Have you ever tried to teach Godfrey a tune? Meaning what? It's a waste of time. He's tone deaf. <laughs> I see. So your religious beliefs are incommunicable, the rest of the world being tone deaf. How convenient. The English middle class is not actually the rest of the world, Flower. It just thinks of itself that way. It has been reenacted, of course. What the hell has? St. Brendan's Voyage. They reconstructed the ancient Irish type of leather boat and managed to sail it from Ireland to Canada. So what? It doesn't prove George right, of course. But they did demonstrate that it was physically feasible. Physically, yeah. Spiritually, though, it's not quite so feasible, Godfrey. True enough, George. Yes, indeed. How do you mean? Godfrey. Think of it. Fourteen hundred years ago. Those monks were living on the final precipice, the west coast of Ireland, the absolute edge of the known world. Every day lifting their eyes across a great grey heaving desert of a sea, stretching to the very rim of the earth itself, an unknown cosmic turbulence. Imagine what it meant to cast yourself into that. No map, no compass, and a shell of stretched cowhide. The boat you can maybe reconstruct, but not the state of being, not the unconditional surrender to God's will, not the wild surge of faith or the rapture of it, the blind leap into the dark. Ah, ah that class of voyage is no longer in the sea's gift. That sounds more like nostalgia for faith than faith itself. Or am I just being tone deaf? You know, your sister's awful clever, Serena. So I'm frequently told. Could I trouble you for another drink, Godfrey? Oh, certainly. I think I'm going to need it. So off they paddle to discover America. That wasn't exactly their intentions, no. Well, it doesn't sound like a pleasure cruise. They were spiritual vagrants. The real voyage was an interior one. It was a quest for a state of grace. Something, Victoria, which actually does still go on. For those of us deficient in righteousness, I mean. I suppose it's space these days. For God's sake, Godfrey, what is? Well, it's our equivalent today, isn't it? Exploring space. The flaming astronauts are scarcely what you'd call saints, are they? Glorified projectiles, that's what those guys are. Oh, some of them are quite safe. Human cannonballs in the scientific circus. Your loss of faith extends to science as well, then. I thought science demolished the need for faith. Well, there are always those who simply refuse to accept evidence. Hard facts. What if I were to tell you, for example, that the lab tests done on your map prove it a fake? Thank you, God. I'll have a word with you later. Oh, hell. That's rotten news. So enthralling, the idea of a boatload of Irish monks stealing a march and all those dagos. I only said, what if? You told me in the kitchen that the test proved it was real. No such thing. What I told you was, there is in fact nothing so far traceable in the vellum or the ink which is inconsistent with a ninth century provenance. Really? And truly. Sorry, God. Pax. Ah, well, that must be rather frustrating for you, Victoria. Not in the least. You see, the only side I'm on is the side of factual evidence. Whichever way it points, I'll follow. I know I'm a mere statistic in the great moronic multitude, but if the tests are so positive, what the bloody hell more do you need? I get people coming in every day of the week with sensational discoveries. Maps under floorboards, maps 
lights on pieces of rock. Your Mr. Reese, Godfrey, produced a Carthaginian map. It was a 1920s diagram of a sewage system in Alexandria. <laughs> so you see, they're all guilty until proved innocent. It's nothing personal, Mr. Mahoney. I'm really sorry to hear that, Ms. Pratt. As far as yours goes, we simply haven't yet tracked down the author. But we will. Ah, oh, where does the evidence point you at next? I suppose I'd better visit your monastery library. Ah, uh, that's not up to much. I presume that would be allowed. Why not? I'll go along with security. That won't be necessary. I didn't mean for you. I meant for the monks. There's absolutely no need for you to come, I assure you. Ah, I'm due a trip anyway. They love getting visits from the fallen. I can make the bookings, if you like. <laughs> it's not going to be an adventure holiday. That remains to be seen. We should be able to eat now, Godfrey. Ah, oh, splendid. I suppose you're a vegetarian, Mr. Mahoney? Yeah, but... Uh, only with regard to liquids. Could you bring that ice bucket, please? <laughs> of course, yes. Taking the opportunity afforded by your presence here today to make a religious observance. Huh. It's quite good, that. Though I'm sure I speak for many of us. In observing that, Religion was always considered quite embarrassing in our family, and it was certainly never discussed in the house, all of us being strictly C of E, and indeed my father being the local vicar. Pause for dutiful laughter. But then, old George had a way of making you wonder if you weren't perhaps missing something deep down that you didn't even know you'd lost. All that talk of his... Holy vagrancy and spiritual landfalls and so on. Not that you always caught his drift exactly, but it was the way he believed in belief itself. The transcendency of it. That was the thing. That's what was gripping. A sort of virtuosity in a lost art. Which cut no ice with Victoria, of course she being the most loyal subject of the entire secular realm. The way the pair of them described that monastery visit, it might have been two entirely different trips. Godfrey, you've got seven minutes to midday. Uh, going. When you think back, it was true about him being a vegetarian drinker. There was nothing he wouldn't drink, except milk and beef tea. I warned you it wasn't up to much. It certainly is a motley collection of books. Uh, the guests use it more than the brothers. I suppose it was the St. Brendan connection which led you to this place? No. Well, it was more the mother connection. Mother? Aye, ah, my mother came from round this way. You mean you're half Irish? At the very least. My word. So many little surprises. Plenty more to come, too. My old man, you see, came over here from Britain right after the war. To do what? To work on a building site. Oh, yes. That was how he met my mother. With him being a Presbyterian, it was impossible for them here. So they eloped together back to Scotland. Gretna Green, I suppose. No, no. Greenock. That's where my dad's family stay. I'm not sure I believe a word of this. <laughs> it takes faith. So, your father was the impetuous romantic type. Have you ever been to Greenock? No, but I take the point. My mother and I escaped back here every summer to stay with my Aunt Lily. It was like the Elysian Fields for both of us. What does your father do? He's a High Court judge. Good steady work. I fear what I'm looking for may not be here. That was certainly my experience. <laughs> is it himself right enough? Father, are you well? Ah, God bless you, Kieran. I'd hardly know your face with the hair on it. <laughs> and this is the English lady you wrote about. Victoria Pratt. Father Alberic. You've come a fair step. How do you do, Abbott? 
Has he married you yet? Alberic. Uh, we have a professional acquaintance only. He'll not be long. Contain yourself. I just hope you can keep him at home longer than we did. As you know, I'm anxious to trace the origins of the book you presented to Mr. Mahoney when he left the order. The Navigatio, Father. Yeah. What about this map? Have you it with you? I've made a copy of it for you. Here you are. Isn't it near enough a miracle? Tell us this, Kieran. Have you peace in your soul this weather? If I had, would you need to ask? <laughs> <laughs> He's a great man for the journey, you see, but he has no stomach for the destination. Yes. I've looked through your index of books, but it doesn't give any details of dates, of accession and such like. Does it not? You don't have any other library records? I've got two boils rummaging round the cellar for you. Oh. However... We had an unfortunate incident here some years back, you know. You mind Brother Eugene? Oh, very well. A library scholar, mark you. And he did a grand job of tidying up the old ledgers and inventories and records and what have you scattered around the house. But he separated all the stuff that was to be kept from all the stuff that wasn't. And then didn't the two piles get confused? <laughs> <laughs> and most of it was burned before he cottoned on to the mistake. Could I talk to him? Nine years dead, I'm afraid. Ah, tell us this. Did you ever hear a yarn like it in all your born days? Pardon? This book here. Ah, sailors' tales may not be renowned for their rigorous honesty, but sure, who would call into question the doings of a saint? Isn't that right? Possibly, yes. The Island of the Birds. Do you mind that, Kieran? Victoria knows it too, Alberic. Ah, ah, here we are. A tree of enormous girth, thick with snowy white buds. And one of them tells Brendan, No sumus de illa magna ruina antiqui hostis. We are some of that great host of fallen angels who fell from God's grace along with Lucifer, forever exiled from heaven, you see, but transformed into white songbirds here on the island on holy days to sing God's praise. Ah, nice enough fall as falls go. And at that minute, the whole flock strikes up together, singing vespers. Quasi carmen plantus pro suavitate. Ah, sweet song, and moving as any lament. Have you ever been there yourself? Where, exactly? America. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it might be a sight to behold. It has rather gone to seed since Brendan's day. Uh, uh, now, here's Malachy, who takes all to do with our books this weather, and used to lend Eugene a hand. Hello. Pleased to meet you. And this here is young Brendan from the village. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, Brendan. Hello. So, what have you managed to excavate here? Have you seen the new creamery, Kieran? No, I've not had that pleasure. Come on and I'll show it to you now. I'll just be a few minutes. Fine. Tell me, Malachy, how much do you know about where all the books here came from? Not much, miss. What about Brother Eugene? Did, did he know much? He did, miss. I don't suppose he used to forge maps in his spare time? No, miss. Uh, he was blind, you see. When did he go blind? Uh, before he joined the order, it was. Stone the crows. Storm the quaff. Storm the <laughs> You mustn't mind, Brendan. He has a want. <laughs> now, uh, would you be looking out for any particular thing? Huh? Yes, oddly enough, I am. I was foolishly hoping to trace the origins of this book. Ah! Oh, Mina oh, Mina uh, Look! Can you get it off him, please? It's rather valuable. Ah, uh, he'll not harm it, miss. He has a powerful love of the books. Loy he! Loy he! Up in Minaga Hain, Malky! Up in Minaga Hain! What's he saying? <laughs> Minaga Hain, miss. What's that? Uh, the big house north of here. Uh, his mother used to be housekeeper there. Minaga Hain. He seems very taken with a book, anyway. Oh, yes. That's where it'll be from, you see. He remembers it. Why on earth would it be from there? 
Uh, now, it may be it would have come from there when the last of the O'Rourke's died, uh, but I couldn't say for sure. Yes? Uh, there was a time when the brothers lived at Mina Gahane, you know. Recently? Mm. Uh, in the days of the penal laws, it was. I see. The family sheltered the monks when Catholicism was outlawed. The old abbey was burnt down by the English king in those days. Terrible times. And you say the Arorks of Mina Gahane have, have all died out? Mm. It was an English lawyer bought the house and lands when the old lady went. Well, perhaps I shall pay a visit to Mina Gahane. It was set on fire and burnt to the ground last year, miss. Oh, wonderful. Ah, oh, wonderful. <laughs> Any luck? Not a lot. The area seems to abound in pyromaniacs. Time to go, Brendan. <laughs> God be with the work, miss. Thank you. <laughs> I'm damned if I know what to believe in this place. You don't often hear that said in a monastery. Frankly, it smells utterly bogus. From that old windbag of an abbot on down. Victoria. Ten minutes of eternal life and you'd be saying the same thing about heaven. You're certainly conforming to type. Holiness confounds you. I think I know a stage Irishman when I see one. And how about a condescending Englishwoman? I came here looking for straight answers to simple questions and nothing more. Colourful anecdotes and blethering holiness I can live without. How the hell do you think they spend their days here, love? Discussing scientific method. You think they hold seminars on bibliography and carbon dating? Any records of provenance here, Malachy? Oh, definitely, dear mud. It was hand-printed in the Low Countries on demi-octavo toilet tissue. Look, so far, I'm contending with records destroyed by a blind, dead librarian and with the word of a village idiot that the book comes from a local stately home recently firebombed into oblivion. What? What, Mina Gahane? Don't you start, for God's sake. It wouldn't maybe have crossed your mind that the map could mean something different to them than it does to you. No, it wouldn't. A map is a map. A manifestation of God, even. An icon, a relic, an object of veneration. How on earth can they venerate something which is very likely a fake? Possibly because the land promised to the saints already exists for them. That's just further mindless blarney. A map is a spatial diagram. It is not an icon. It is a functional tool for people wanting to get from A to B. And if St. Brendan's lot were anything like their present counterparts, I would doubt their ability to discover a route from here to the outside toilet. You are on the worst possible grounds, my girl, for sarcasm on that score. Your own people are not exactly famous for their powers of discovery around here. <sighs> You'd think after all these years they would have managed to discover Ireland, at least. But then the English genius was always more for expropriation, wasn't it? You could always rely on the continentals to actually find the countries, whereupon you could move in and dispossess them. That's the way you badged the map of the world with red while you kept yourselves sweet and wholesome at home. You exercised the idea of hell from the English shires by exporting it to the rest of us. Well, listen, this island you're on now is where it started, and this is where it's drawing to a close. This is where you've always come to unleash your most damnable nightmares and devils. But once you're out of here, Flower, there'll be nowhere left for the dark to go. The English hell will finally come home to roost. It's already happening. So what price then your complacency, your self-righteousness, your sanctimony, your contempt for any other world than your own dwindling patch of barrenness? Extraordinary. I never in my life expected to be taken for Queen Victoria. I suppose everybody with an Irish granny learns a speech like that by heart. You know, I read once about an instruction in an old mapmaker's handbook. Where you know nothing, place terrors. Just don't be so certain sure of your ground all the time. You never know when you might find yourself on terra incognita. Pax. What on earth do you think you're doing? There's a way to check up on that book, incidentally. Assuming you're still interested. Oh, 
Yes, the book. I knew there was some dim reason for being in this godforsaken hole. <laughs> Scarcely godforsaken. Correction. God-infested hole. It was the Oroch family of Minagohane who endowed the Abbey. This used to be their land. So? Theirs was one of the few Catholic big houses, one of the very few that survived in the family's ownership from Cromwell's day. <laughs> Till the IRA got it, that is. So, the book could very well have come from their library. So what? The Oroch papers were bequeathed to the state by the old lady. They're in an archive in the public record office in Cork. I find that too straightforward to be plausible. I'll leave it up to you, Flower. I know how much you like to take the initiative. Where did you read that epithet? What? Where you know nothing, place terrors. It's rather good. Isn't it? I should imagine it would apply to Irish hotels. Perhaps you can advise me. I can stay at my Aunt Lily's. Thank you, but I think I would feel more at ease in a hotel. It is a hotel. Oh. A one and a half star rating. It used to be two stars, but uh, one of them got hit with a shotgun pellet. <laughs> Sounds about my level. <laughs> Very good. Come on, follow me. As a great man once said, time is but the stream I go fishing in. Meaning God knows what. And as we regale ourselves today by its slow-moving waters, I can certainly pride myself on having landed a prize catch. Whew, but there again, there must be a better quotation than that you can dredge up. George would have known one. He was a walking dictionary of them. Though most of them were of his own invention, like his Freudian theory of British history. England as the ego, Ireland as the id, America as the asylum. By which Victoria was not amused. Oh, it's quite good, that. In fact, she was pretty thin-lipped about that whole Irish escapade. How they got through it together without coming to blows, I can't imagine. The entire thing is your fault, do you realise? It actually wasn't, of course, but I couldn't help enjoying the accusation. It was you who put him on to her. You have to admit, it's exciting, Serena. Exciting? It's grotesque. How could she fall for that Glaswegian dingbat? Victoria for George? Oh, no, there's no likelihood of that. They can't abide one another. For Christ's sake, Godfrey, they're at each other like dogs in heat. Why don't you do something? You've been mooning around after her for long enough. They've only been together a lot because of today's meeting. Victoria's been working flat out on her report. Flat out is too bloody right. What meeting? Dr Bridges and his assistant librarians. It's to decide on whether to purchase the map for the library. Victoria could become quite famous, you know. I don't want her being famous. She's my sister. Oh, think about how you could use it, though, to publicise your business. That's the same gormless thing Harvey Small said, and he doesn't even have your excuse. Who's Harvey Small? Nobody. He's taken my old office. He's a private investigator, if you must know. Seriously? A gumshoe? A real sleuth? A private dick? Well, he certainly hasn't flashed it at me yet. Oh, that's great. Is he all trench coat and lucky strikes and a low fedora? No, he isn't. He's all plastic mac and a corduroy cap and a packet of polo mints. Oh, what exactly does he do? He says if this map thing gets in the papers, I ought to cash in on it. But I wouldn't give Mahoney the satisfaction. To tell you the truth, I think you'd be inclined to find it rather offensive. Really? Perhaps I'll reconsider. <laughs> when does this meeting begin? Any time now. It's all supposed to be terribly hush-hush. I'll go and ring the Sunday Times in that case. Yeah, I don't really think you ought to do that, Serene. But she did, of course. And I suppose, for the outside world, that was when the story really began. The mapping of Antarctica, George, is not exactly material just at the moment. All the same. You'd say that when it was finished after World War II, the map of the world was essentially completed. What of it? Even before there was writing, there must have been some jokers scratching directions in the dust, making a picture of the known world. And over thousands of generations, the picture was slowly added to. Fields, counties, countries, continents. 
Finally, in our own time, the picture of the world is fully painted at long last. Now, tell me, how did this momentous occasion pass unremarked? Because map makers don't indulge in idle romantic vaporings. Ah, oh, maybe it fills them with an instinctive dread. What does, George? The prospect of a world that's fully known. No more hidden valleys, no more dark interiors. Just what's here, what's on the map. The end of adventure. The death of all the planet's potentialities. Uh, ah, here you are. Uh, Godfrey and I are about to embark on a beverage, Dr Bridges. Well, thank you for looking in today. You certainly have confounded us with this find of yours. Ah, oh, well, it's all due to Godfrey. He assured me that nobody could touch Miss Pratt. Quite so. Goodbye, Mr Mahoney. Goodbye, Godfrey. Guard be with the work, miss. Uh, right then. I'll see you later. Perhaps. <sighs> Dear me, you don't suppose there's likely to be a fuss over this, do you? I devoutly hope so, Dr. Bridges. Uh, you're still young, Miss Pratt. Accept the word of an old campaigner that it's best never to believe with too much seriousness. Comedy, you know, ends in a wedding, but... Tragedy always on a stage bestrewn with deeply convinced corpses. In my case, neither outcome has the least appeal, any more than endless equivocation does. No, quite so, though short-term equivocation has much to recommend it. Mm. May we intrude ourselves into these proceedings? Ah, yes, gentlemen. <laughs> please, uh, do come in and uh, sit down, please. Ah. Thank you. Now then... As you are aware, the time has arrived to review our preliminary findings on this map, which I suppose we must call the Brendan map, since everybody else will. My dears, Brendan map sensation. Shamrock Saint, first ashore, say expert. Columbus capsized. Saintly sea dog showed the way. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, well, I have interviewed both uh, Mr Mahoney and Dr Dudley. There seems to be no question that it was a bona fide discovery. Whether anything else will be at all clear from this point on, I beg leave to doubt. We are, of course, all agreed that it's a 17th century forgery. I take it. Speak for yourself, dear. I must say I would prefer it to be a 17th century forgery. It would have so much more charm. I'm still convinced it's an April Fool from that spiteful witch at the British Museum. We haven't been paying attention to our wormholes and stitch marks, have we? I can't think what you mean, nurse. <laughs> On your evidence, Mr Proctor, the stitching and worming in the parchment match that in the book? To a veritable nicety. Good. I've traced the book to its source. It was printed and bound in Limerick in 1649. Limerick? <laughs> there was a seafarer called Brendan. This was in a small printing house owned by a branch of the O'Rourke family of Kerry. Uh, who engendered dissension unending. It remained in the library of the family seat at Minagohain up until 25 years ago when it passed into the care of the Ardfert Cistercians from where Mr Mahoney acquired it. Well done, Miss Brady. He'd have spoken more faintly and acted less saintly if he knew what he'd started a trend I in. <laughs> hmm. Now, uh, Miss Pratt, uh, what are your views on this poem? I've heard better limericks, though it's not a form I admire. Oh, no, no, no. I was thinking more of the love poem on the back of the map parchment. Yes, uh, yes, of course. Is there a candidate for it? There were three daughters of the family at the relevant time. The youngest, Finula, appears to have died in 1650 and was buried in unconsecrated ground along with the mutilated body of an English captain of artillery. Spicy. Shaping up very nicely for a television deal. So far, I have no clear lead on the map parchment prior to this date, but one point is worth noting. The O'Rourke family's close relationship to the monastery goes back beyond the dissolution in 1536 to its foundation in the 12th century. The map almost certainly originated in Ardfert, only to return there, unbeknownst, in our own time. You're not suggesting it's older than the book? Why not? The vellum certainly is, by your own account. 
So apparently is the ink. Suddenly I have a sickening feeling that our Miss Pratt has decided to go for bust on this one. You don't actually buy it, Vic. Yes. I believe I do. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, at least I've secured your undivided attention. People who threaten to jump from tall buildings generally do, dear. It does rather entail the rewriting of the history of Western cartography, Miss Pratt. Oh, I should have thought that was the least of it. But on such tenuous evidence... The provenance is sound enough. The forensic results are, at worst, neutral. The historical evidence we haven't even touched on yet. An Irish map. It's like some terrible joke. <laughs> the foremost medieval geographer was an Irishman called de Coul. In the early 9th century, the period in question, he was court geographer to Charlemagne. Yes, but I don't recall him leaving us lightning sketches of the American coastline. <laughs> in his book of the Earth's Measurement, he describes the midnight sun and refers to colonies of Irish monks in the Faroes and in Iceland. This was 300 years after the time of Brendan himself. Remember, three centuries of continuous seafaring and of academic inquiry in the Irish schools. Well, I'm amazed they hadn't started flights to Boston, aren't you? <laughs> the Martyrology of Donegal lists 26 notables named Coleman. One of them has the given name Imramar, meaning of the voyage. The name that appears on the map. <sighs> show us a few more of his maps and I might even begin to believe it. I can certainly show you maps. Lights, please. Oh. oh, God, it's home movie time. And to think that people complain about the dearth of live entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Hereford Mapamundi of 1275. Oh. The island of St. Brendan is located just here. Leave off, Vic. This is four centuries further on. Oh. All in good time, Mr. Proctor. Oh. Here we have the globe of Martin Behaim, constructed immediately prior to 1492. So this is the world as Christopher Columbus perceived it to be before his voyages. St. Brendan's Island is here. Another century further on, a chart by Ortelius. Oh. By now, of course, the American discoveries are well established. Notwithstanding, St. Brendan's Island lingers on. Right here. As a last example, here it is again in the celebrated Mercator Hondius Atlas of 1595. <sighs> so, there you are. Well, it was certainly very big in its day. A legend, in fact, in its own lifetime. The longest-running imaginary island in the history of real estate. <laughs> or, in this case, unreal estate. Uh, it's uh, a tradition which survives on countless other charts well into the 17th century. The question is, where did it originate? Right here, darling, in Uncle Brendan's bedtime book of topping tales, high on the fiction list for a good half millennium. That's what's always been assumed. But, supposing St. Brendan's Island was an actual cartographic tradition, supposing Mercator and Ortelius and Behaim and all the others, stretching back into obscurity, were preserving the authoritative evidence of an early Irish map such as this one. It's inconceivable that the Irish monks of the ninth century, the learned heirs of a long seafaring tradition, lacked the capacity to draw maps. So why have no others been discovered yet? It's very simple. In the succeeding 200 years, the Vikings picked Ireland clean. But it says here, on the map, I, Coleman, Imrama, set down this true image of the Blessed Isles to the west in the year the Northmen first put to the flames the great Clonmacnoise. In my view, this map is an astonishing, unique and authentic survival from that lost era. So, Miss Pratt believes in the map. I think it's imperative that we acquire it. And uh, Mr Proctor? Oh, me of little faith. Sorry, love, but I'm for saying we're just looking, thanks. And Mr Gamble? I simply loathe being sold a pup, and God knows plenty have been. <laughs> 
Indeed, yes. There must be the unhappy memory of the Finland map in all our thoughts. Well, even before that, there were those Italian fakes the Brazilians bought for a packet. I think the consensus seems to be for a further period of work on the map before we decide for or against purchase. Absolutely. Yes. OK. Fine. One question, though. What if Mr Mahoney decides to offer the map elsewhere? Oh, I shouldn't think there's any likelihood. He knows we're acting in good faith. He has had an invitation from Harvard. Harvard? How the bloody hell did they get onto it? Oh, I suppose he made photocopies. Oh, well. Dear me. Isn't it marvellous? It puts a flaming fat in the fire, all right. He's bloody well going to let the Yanks get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they never miss a trick, do they, smarmy buggers? It does put a slightly different complexion on the matter. Now I'll say. What have they offered him? I've no idea. We'd better look sharp, though, knowing those ponces. Huh? They'd have the pants off your granny. <laughs> how much could we afford? Well, how much would he swallow? Well, if the map were ninth century, it would, of course, be beyond price. As a 17th century fake, it would be a vastly more modest acquisition. I don't see how he can get away with less than 30,000. Oh, leave off! Ten would be plenty to gamble at this stage. My understanding is that Mr Mahoney intends donating the entire sum to the monastery. <sighs> Oh, well, let's make it ten. Mm. Harvard, of course, as we all know, is loaded. Perhaps we had better stretch to twenty. Oh, we're going to look like prize chumps if it turns out a dud. On the other hand, if it has value, we won't be accused in retrospect of swindling a community of monks. Agreed? Certainly. Fine. Well, if you all say so... But it's going to leave an ugly, great, gaping hole in the budget. I fear the trouble of this calibre never comes cheap. You had better make the arrangements right away, Mr. Gamble. Be sure to attach a proviso of confidentiality. Too right. Further at bay, the press hounds are kept the better. Thank you all. Bravo, Vic. The audacity of the child. We are impressed. We'll do a book about it, of course. If it's warranted. There'll be no talking to her after this. My dear, a star is born. <laughs> well, good. There's a journalist across in the pub wanting to talk to you. Yes. He claims it's about an Irish map. That's all. The library's just decided to buy one for 20,000. You're not serious. No, oh, yes, I am. Come here. Mm. I really disapprove of people kissing like that. In company, I mean. It's a form of emotional advertising, isn't it? The height of bad manners, that's what I call it. Of course, people are at their most inconsiderate and selfish when they're in love. You only have to watch them. Oh, for God's sake, put a stopper in it! They didn't uh, challenge your findings. What, in the face of the evidence? Oh, by the way, if anyone mentions Harvard to you, just confirm that you've had an inquiry, OK? Harvard? Today, of course, is above all an occasion for sharing. The sharing of our happiness with all of you. At least it solved his accommodation problem. They got quite complicated. With her working away on the book, I saw a lot of them that year. I remember the four of us going horse racing. And where was that? It was a steeplechase somewhere. In the big race, there was a horse called Magic Map, which, of course, George and Victoria backed. I backed one called Bystander. Serena back guided missile, which, needless to say, was the winner. What happened to Magic Map? I can't remember whether it even finished or not. Godfrey, can you come here, please? Uh, just coming. As for bystander, broke a leg. Had to be shot. Leaving in five minutes, Godfrey. Uh, nearly ready. There are always those cynics amongst us who will maintain that matrimony is defunct. Those who are always ready to cry wolf with regard to wedlock. To whom marriage is a brightly packaged anachronism. Which is quite true, of course. People do it more out of inertia than belief these days. Still, 
You can hardly say that, can you? It was lucky, though, that George subscribed to the institutional theory. Clubability. One person doesn't marry another. They both just get wedded to the institution of marriage itself. Which seems reasonable enough to me. Actually, that's why you tell people I'm getting married. Instead of saying who to. But I suppose, having fought his way out of one institution, George wasn't about to sign himself into another. At least neither he nor Victoria showed any such tendency. Much to your secret relief. She just beavered away at the book, and he... Come to think of it, what did he do during those 18 months? He was a barman for a while, I remember. Then he was a taxi driver. But he spent more time in the bar as a taxi driver than he had as a barman, which accounted for those two jobs. Then he was a hospital porter. Actually, he spent a lot of time in the bar, irrespective of jobs. And you, Godfrey, were generally with him on these occasions. Oh. Mercy, mercy, mercy. No wonder you have trouble remembering most of it. Still alive, Godfrey? Oh. How goes it at the hospital, George? Much as when you left it last night, I imagine. I seem to have trouble remembering most of last night. You kissed the entire nursing staff uh, at the maternity wing. Oh, no. <laughs> most of the mothers and babies, too. I had to send you home in an ambulance. Good God. Was I injured? You were totally disabled. But that's despicable. What about you? I was sacked. But that's terrible, all because of me. Uh, no, I'm afraid not, Godfrey. It's merely that horseplay and drunken repartee is the exclusive privilege of the student doctors. I have been dissolute above my station. <sighs> what do you do now? Uh, I suppose we could try ripping up a few more old books. George. Guilty. I woke up clutching a single red Wellington boot. <laughs> that belongs to a radiographer from Troon. You drank a pint of bitter out of it. Oh, I hate beer. We inferred as much from the speed with which you disgorged it. Oh, Lord. It's so shaming. Sunday morning weather, Godfrey. A low-lying miasma of guilt and remorse blankets the entire country. Uh, speaking of Sunday morning, how are the papers today? Ah. Any reviews? Ah, yes. It is not too often that a work of scholarship reads like a top-flight thriller. But Victoria Pratt is a spellbinder. As to the case which she makes out for the authenticity of this remarkable map, I, for one, am no more inclined to put it down than I was her enthralling book. My word. Are they all like that? Ah, uh, not entirely. Some of the others are less carping. It's turning into a real monster success. Or a monster, anyway. But it's creating a sensation. Only as a novelty item. Oh, they're all so damned predictable. Have you have you yet read one comment on the impulses behind the map? The hunger to navigate your way into the knowledge of God? So far as this culture goes, it's just another commodity. I should have thrown it in the fire. Uh, that's a bit strong, George. Yeah. I'm half inclined to disown it as a fake. Nobody will believe you. Not without proof. What well, the hell, Godfrey? It'll be forgotten soon enough. Once the next sensation turns uh, up... Not in the profession, it won't. Oh, yes. Uh, the profession. Oh, morning. Hello, Serena. I suppose the main attraction is still in bed with a champagne breakfast. That was quite a coincidence last Sunday, Serena. Wasn't it? What was? Well, I bumped into Serena on the Glasgow sleeper. Harvey Small is certainly a lively sort. Isn't he? Who's Harvey Small? A business associate. He's Serena's private dick. For God's sake, stop calling him that. <laughs> Who do you need a private dick for? We happen to have adjacent offices. Who does? Serena and Harvey Small. She was saying that they have adjacent orifices. Oh, such a hoot. Oh, I could have sworn there was a clean pair of socks in here. These jeans are a bit past their prime. Ooh. Oh, good show, Victoria. With the reviews, I mean. Thank you, Godfrey. Have you read this interview? Oh, that thing. It's pathetic. 
The brunette and brainy Victoria Pratt does for blue stockings what Mae West did for the life jacket. He was a lecherous old fart, that one. Let's hope as more women rise to the top of their careers that Miss Pratt is indeed the shape of things to come. Why do you stand for such insulting build? George, do you really have to do that to your socks? It's like... Like a terrier with a dead rat. I can hardly go into the Lord's house bullock naked, Fleur. So we're supposed to watch you sniff your way through your entire wardrobe? Victoria, it's a simple test of the freshness of my apparel, conducted out of concern for my fellow man. By the by, I had a wee sniff around your chemise earlier on. It smells a mite garlicky. There is a laundrette down the road well worth a visit. Not as long as you're prepared to do it for him. Never shrink girls from the properties of their flesh. In our fallen state, spirit and matter are interwoven into one fabric. The more you lose touch with the physical world, the blinder you grow to the metaphysical, till you end up with Anglicanism. There is no paradox in the fact that the most devout section of any society is always the peasants, people who can stick a pig or geld a horse with the greatest of equanimity. If you're so concerned for your fellow man, you might have the decency to dress in the bedroom. Tell us this, Serena. How does old Harvey manage? With his smalls, I mean. I'll fetch him round and you can ask him yourself. Oh, I was just interested on account of his line of business. You know, washing other people's in public. I thought you were on duty today in the hospital, George. Aye, well, uh, Godfrey and I have decided to go on a church crawl. Uh, isn't that right, Godfrey? Sorry? We intend to return fragrant with the odour of sanctity. Church? In the great Navagatio itself, it is written that those few who returned from the land promised to the saints had a sweet, unearthly smell clinging to their garments. And this was even before there was laundrettes. You've been sacked again, haven't you? Uh, it may have been largely my fault, I think. I thought as much from your fragrant odour arriving home at five this morning. Yes, indeed. I was up half the night, adamantly refusing all their entreaties to withdraw my resignation. Such strength of character. Ah, oh, don't bugger about, Flower. If you've got something to say, say it. You'd better go. It would never do to keep the Lord waiting. Damn you. If she won't say it, I will. You're nothing but a shiftless, lazy, hypocritical bastard. Quit it, Serena. Restrain yourself, Godfrey. We shall say a special prayer for the repose of Serena's soul. Oh. Come, Godfrey. Right. See you a bit later, then. Oh, how you can bear him. I shall Let's never... Let's just him. leave it there, shall we? No, we shan't. He's an idle dosser, and you let him walk all over you. If he's walking all over me, then you can scarcely call him idle, can you? Mummy was right. That man is dragging you down to his own level. I expect she was, and he is. So why don't you just bugger off home, Serena? Charming. Now that you're a media personality, I'm not permitted to open my mouth, I suppose. Finally, we come to the real point, at least. What the hell's come over you? Why are you suddenly turning on me? It's the little sister act in full swing, isn't it? I take it this is meant to imply that I'm jealous of your famous book. You're certainly ungenerous to a fault. Oh, what? Look at these papers. My name is splashed all over them, in the news section, the reviews, even in the ghastly supplements. My book has finally appeared to near-unanimous raves. It doesn't happen that often. I'd like to hear a few bells pealing. I beg permission to indulge in just a, a glimmer of satisfaction, for Christ's sake. Instead of which, I, I get you stumping in here, glowering at all and sundry, and bitching away about one trashy interview. Well, it's all Mahoney's fault. The very sight of him drives me into a frenzy. You've never forgiven him for discovering the map. It's nothing to do with that. It's the way he's been sponging off you for a year and a half now. He's taken this place over. He's everywhere like a mouldering lump of old Stilton. I never see you anymore. Either you're buried in your work or you're with him. I expect it's because we're living together, wouldn't you say? I just don't know what you see in him, Vic. I suppose it's his desperation, really. It's like one of those westerns, the schoolmarm who falls for the desperado. People like me always end up falling for an outlaw. It's the thought of him as an in-law that frightens me. That's never how it works out, and least of all in this picture. He's so awful to you. Only because he holds me personally responsible for Cromwell, the Battle of Culloden, the Highland Clearances, the Great Famine and Bloody Sunday. All right. 
So I've been a shrew, agreed, unspeakable. You're in the right as usual. Fair enough. You've been having a rotten time. I know that. I've never really got over losing those chartered accountants in Borneo. Nobody blamed you for it. I was categorically assured that the trip had been cleared with the tribal elders. It was obviously just some misunderstanding. How can there be a misunderstanding with headhunters? I mean, it has to be either or, doesn't it? Supposing they died in a plane crash, it would have amounted to the same thing. People don't look at it that way. It's become a standing joke in the business. At conferences and whatnot, they just all fall about, oh, hello, Serena, how are things at head office? Oh, that crap. I've no idea. If it hadn't been for Harvey's support, I really think I'd have shut up shop by this time. You and Harvey seem to have grown very close. It's not what you think, though. He's a mother's boy. They live together in a bungalow, and during the day she sticks pins in my effigy. Not the normal image of a private eye. I reckon he does the job to compensate. So you've every reason for feeling got at. It's still no excuse for behaving like a burk. The fact is, I'm not a bit jealous of your fame. I'm just insanely green with envy, that's all. <laughs> you needn't be. It feels like being pitchforked into a freak show. You heard what happened to the book in the States. No, what? The award-winning publisher managed to launch it on the 12th of October. So? It only happens to be Columbus Day. His offices have been picketed by the Friends of Italy. The Spanish ambassador has delivered a note of protest to the State Department, and I've got a parcel of hate mail from outraged mafiosi. You're not serious. Listen, that's only the most recent outbreak. You wouldn't credit some of the letters and phone calls I've been getting. What uh, nasties? They just keep crawling out of the woodwork. The latest one was the editor of a pornographic magazine. What sort of proposal did he have in mind? What we have in mind, Miss Pratt, is a tasteful two-page spread. My, what a handsome globe you have. <laughs> I expect you say that to all the girls. <laughs> what do you foresee being spread, precisely? Well, that's it right there, you see. Witty, repartee, fantastic. Received wisdom would have it that a woman of intelligence and wit is not a sexy woman. But I assure you, the opposite view is held by the kind of man who reads Gonad. I see. It's a sort of map collector's weekly of the hardcore magazine trade. Uh, eroticism provides the main thrust, I don't deny. But notwithstanding, we are constantly upheld for the redeeming social content of our features and short fiction. Supposing I write you a paper on women in the cartographic profession. Oh, uh, I appreciate the thought, Miss Pratt, but we are, I'm afraid, in a competitive position subject to the constraints of the leisure market. Now, what I envisage is a short disquisition on your life and work, quite jocular in tone, accompanied by a pictorial study of yourself in a similar light-hearted vein. You're going straight for the jocular vein, in short. Oh, what a fantastic caption that will make. I like to go straight for the jocular vein, says Victoria. 34, MSC, FRGS. Yeah, but as to the photograph itself, uh, well, perhaps we could persuade you to sit astride a globe, rather like your own large one here. Uh, well, one of those illuminated ones will be amusing. Yeah, you, you could be perusing your book. What would you suggest I wear? Just a, a board of board, perhaps. <laughs> Oh, no, no, blame me. I, I haven't even mentioned that term. Yet. Well, goodbye. And I'm happy to say we can pay contributors the very highest rate. Out. Yes, well, you'll want to have a little think. But do bear in mind, uh, it is a wasting asset. Oh, I'd almost do it. Just to see how it'd be received in the conference hall. With an onslaught of heavy breathing, I should think. What conference hall? The International Society of Cartographers. They're laying on a special Brendan map conference. It's to give all the leading authorities a chance to have a showdown with me. All the ageing gunfighters will be riding into town. It should be quite a shootout. You're the desperado in this house. Why should they have it in for you anyway? I'm jeopardising their accepted theories and their definitive studies. Meaning they'll go to any lengths to discredit the map and the book, both. Still, all oh, this press support is very encouraging. I think I can take them. Hmm. The poor buggers don't know what they're in for. Guess what I have in the fridge? Shrunken heads. <laughs> That's for later. So long as they don't belong to my chartered accountants. It's a magnum of Bollinger. I suppose you expect me to drink it with you? Well, 
You must have quite a thirst from eating all that humble pie. <laughs> Bitch. It has been said that those who can do, and those who can't teach. As to those who can't teach, there's always administration. You being the case in point. Or, of course, attending conferences. It was like a bad day at the United Nations, that conference. When we speak of the birthplace and growth of our cartography, we speak of Genoa, Pisa, Milan, Castile, Lisbon. We do not speak of northern primitives. He was quite beside himself, that old Spanish gent. Him and the Norwegian became a sort of double act. The Viking discovery of America around the year 1000, solidly documented, is in no way challenged by Miss Pratt's wild hypothesis. In his rediscovery of the continent in 1492, Columbus was, of course, massively indebted to his Norse predecessors. Before, Excuse me. I challenge Professor Erickson to name any map or document from the whole of southern Europe during the entire Middle Ages which makes the least mention of a Norse landfall in America. Dr. Cortez knows, of course, that I cannot. Thank you. However... The reason being, the Norse landfall was an isolated insignificant incident. Discovery is opening a country up, establishing it in the network of world communications. Let nobody pretend that America was discovered by anybody other than Christopher Columbus. Although it wasn't really. Well, not in the way you're defining it. In that sense, Columbus was in the same boat as the Vikings and the Irish. None of them was aware of the existence of a large independent continent. An actual new world was surmised first by Vespucci and established first by Vasco Nunez. To Balboa. That shut him up all right. Or it would have done if you'd said it. Still, the others were all behind the map. Especially that young American. Gentlemen, from henceforth, we're into a brand new ball game. Mind you, with a name like Sean Kilroy. Furthermore, Victoria has covered every base superbly from the lab analyses on through. Such tests prove nothing. Oh, that's crazy, Juan. Example, there is a certain Italian paleographer, known personally to me, whose pastime is to forge medieval scripts on authentic parchment. The ink? <laughs> no problem. He makes his own from medieval recipes. We were all quite keen to meet this man. It's all just... Private fun and games, you understand. Also, there has been much talk of wormholes. Listen, nothing is easier to forge than wormholes. Poking with a little piece of hot wire, that's all. If it comes to that, I have heard from reliable sources of an English antiquarian who keeps a stable of live worms. They all had this obsession with worms. I tell you, the worming is a, a red herring. Take a look at those holes under a microscope, Torvald. What have you got? Serrations around the edge of each perimeter. Yes, teeth marks. A piece of hot wire, Torvald, cannot chew. Furthermore, compare the holes in the map with those in the end papers. The worm's teeth patterns are identical. Very well. So maybe we have worms. How do we date these worms? They are 9th century, 19th century, who can tell? What the worming indicates is the map has been inside that book at least since 1649, because there's no way the map could have been implanted in the book and the worming artificially induced without violation of the binding. And the binding in which the book is still bound is the original binding. They went on like that for three days. The why leading scholars are expected to be more rational than the rest of mankind, I can't imagine, considering their missionary zeal. At any rate, Victoria certainly came out of it with the world at her feet. At which point, of course, she kicked for touch and withdrew. Hello, Godfrey. I did think it odd at the time. All on your own? Oh, not for long round this way. It's all go. It'll be all gone soon enough. Oh, happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. You remember the turnips? Yeah, in the kitchen. Well done. I haven't made jack-o'-lantern since I was in knee socks. How are you? Hey, 
Me? You mean? How's your extramural department? Oh, it's going strong. You know what they're like, extramural people, kinky for knowledge. No matter how much red tape you tie them down with, they still somehow wriggle through to the classroom. You're an imposter, Godfrey. Am I? Aren't we all? Are we? All this self-deprecation is a sham. You privately care a great deal about your work, but you're too much of a stuffy English academic to admit it, even to yourself. Uh, I do quite enjoy not having to teach any more. I'll admit that. You think, deep down, that you're doing an important job rather well. Well, the thing about teaching was, nobody ever seemed able to listen to what I was saying. I suppose, in a way, because it was all quite bone-achingly pedestrian. Still, it is fairly dispiriting, nobody listening to you like that. There you are, day after day, talking away at this bank of faces, with all the heavy eyelids slowly drooping. <laughs> the diligent ones are all trying hard to swallow a yawn with horrible facial contortions, while the soppy ones are all glassy-eyed and miles away, simpering foolishly into the middle distance. <laughs> it's like a ward in a lunatic asylum. <laughs> After watching them for a while, you get mesmerised by the sound of your own voice. I was forever nodding off in the middle of me, Lexis. I woke up from a dream once shouting, Cut the rope! <laughs> None of the students seemed to notice. I'm not... Not boring you, am I? Fake. I do seem to be a bit better at administration, I think. A sudden burst of candour. Well, nobody expects to have to listen to administrators. They even talk to each other in an impenetrable gibberish. I find all this a little bit unsettling, Victoria. All this what? All this way we're having a sort of conversation. We used to have conversations. Yeah. Oh, we had a few during our student days. Was this how you saw your life turning out back then? Oh, I'm afraid it is. Those were the sort of conversations we always used to have. Yes. What does the future have in store? Everything in the book except marriage. <laughs> that was the only constant thing that the whole group agreed on. Remember that? Sure. <laughs> I look at them all now. A couple of brats apiece and mortgaged up to the rafters. We're the only two left with unblemished integrity, Godfrey. You're not by any chance contemplating marriage, are you? Why? Are you? Well, you know. Is this how you foresaw your life turning out back then? I'm afraid it is. Up to a point, which is now lost. Feeling our age, are we, I hope? It's her birthday today. That is what I meant, Godfrey. Oh. You can certainly tell she's a Halloween baby, a born witch. Oh, of course. It's Halloween. You're getting faster all the time, Godfrey. I always used to like having a birthday at Halloween. It made it more special. What's your birthday, Serena? I was a little leap year baby. February bloody 29th. <laughs> Don't get her started. Where's this booze up I was promised? You help yourself. I have to see to the victuals. Godfrey's going to make us jack-o'-lanterns. Mm. The onset of infantile regression, I suppose. Come on, Godfrey. Right. Can I use the phone? Go ahead. Oh. Um, Harvey. Hello. I it's me. I'm all right. Did you have any luck with your vanishing choir master? Not the organist's wife. Did you? Well, how much were you able to find out? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Don't mind me. Oh. It's just my contribution to the Halloween celebrations. Have you been eavesdropping? No, I've come to haunt you. Oh, the hello, Harvey. Oh, no, I'm all right. Fine. Look, I'm in Vic's flat at the moment. I'll see you later, all right? Bye. How is Harvey, by the way? Busy. You sure and give him my regards? Drink. I'll have a gin and tonic, thank you. And how's the tourist trade, Serena? A very large one, please. Oh, as bad as that, eh? I don't suppose you're delivering a yacht to some distant place soon, George, like the Bermuda Triangle? That's where some of your tours go, isn't it? You haven't delivered any yachts at all in the time we've been privileged to know you. Rich men's toys, Serena. I put the life of the Sybarite behind me. Oh, that's too bad. Here, drink this. Cheers. Cheers. 
Mm. I've been spending my days conning wisdom from Victoria's bookshelves. Oh, a self-taught working-class intellectual. Though Harvey says he met someone who claims she read geography with you at Glasgow University, I think it was. Tell us this, Serena. Did you ever hear tell of Eratosthenes? Not for ages. Eratosthenes. What a man. A scholar of the ancient Greek persuasion. Third century BC. Although they didn't know then it was BC, of course. Any more than they knew what size the world was. So Eratosthenes set out to measure it. Is this going to go on all night? Was exactly the question, Serena. He was himself asked, rather cretinously, since he was at the time observing shadows cast by a vertical pole at noon on Midsummer's Day. Though at a place called Syene, there was no shadow cast at all. So he decided that it must lie on the summer tropic. But north of it, at Alexandria, there was a shadow cast which was measurable as the 50th part of a circle. So he concluded that the distance between the two places, multiplied by 50, would yield the true circumference of the earth. Clever old him. Ah, except he was wrong about Syene being on the tropic. Wrong about it being due south of Alexandria. Wrong about the distance between them. And he wasn't to know that the earth isn't a perfect sphere anyway. <laughs> a comedy of errors indeed. But the gods favoured Eratosthenes. His mistakes magically cancelled one another out. He proclaimed the Earth's circumference to be 24,600 odd miles, which was within 50 miles of the exact figure. Well, I never. Loud applause. Alas, more was to befall. You can pour me another drink in that case. A couple of hundred years later, a meddlesome fellow called Posidonius decided to put matters right. He took new bearings from the stars and denounced Eratosthenes as a messer, whose sums he'd been clever enough to straighten out. The trouble was, though, Posidonius' new figure for the Earth's circumference was only 18,000 miles, which you and I and Eratosthenes know to be 25% too small. Here you go. Thank you. I certainly needed this. Now, Serena... This gross miscalculation went unchallenged for the next 1,600 years. All that time, the world was believed to be a quarter smaller than it really was. That's why Columbus went to his grave, still convinced that he'd reached Asia the back way. All on account of a wee Greek git from 90 BC. I presume there's a point to all this. Oh, I believe there is, Serena. Here's to the spirit of Eratosthenes and boils on the bum for the descendants of Posidonius. In our case, George, I've got your number, and no mistake, exact to the nearest decimal point. Try not to bet on it, Flower. You could be making yet another gross miscalculation. Dr. Bridges has called in. I'm, uh, I'm interrupting your party. I don't believe you've met my sister, Serena. Uh, no, how do you do? Oops, it's meet the boss time. George, you already know, of course. Uh, yes, uh, hello once again. What's your tipple, Dr. Bridges? Uh, thank you, but uh, no, no, I don't indulge. I wouldn't impose on you in this way if it weren't for an unforeseen calamity, but you see, my wireless has gone completely dead. Oh, God, don't tell us. You'd only started checking your coupon and you'd already had two draws. Sorry? Dr Bridges has recorded a talk which is being broadcast this evening. Yeah, just a little talk in the interval of a concert. It's coming on quite soon, you see. I, I couldn't think of anyone else. I'm so sorry to barge in. No, you're very welcome. Please, please sit down. Thank you. I'll set this thing to switch itself on at a quarter past. Uh, that way we'll be sure not to miss it. Good. There. My wireless is quite ancient, you know. It's one of the big wooden cabinets full of coloured lights. Oh, people <laughs> collect those nowadays. Yeah, quite so. <sighs> ah, well. well. We've all been having a good old natter about uh, Eratosthenes. Oh, yes. Not forgetting that price chump Posidonius. What is your talk about, Dr Bridges? Oh, uh, nothing very much, I assure you. Semantics, isn't it? Yeah, with a little etymology. It's just a brief reflection on the various meanings of a cognate group of words. Uh, band, bind, and bound. Sounds like a winner to me. My favourite work is on dictionaries, you see. Uh, wh what's so special about bind and bond? Oh, well, um, a little word like 
bond, you know, is almost paradoxical in its various usages. A bond between us is a uniting tie, a bond I place upon you as an instrument of restraint. And a bond with a blonde as a spy. Ah, yes, 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 I mentioned that too. James Bond is a clever name for a secret agent, you know. It certainly sounds better than Harvey Small. It has the ring of strength and dependability. An Englishman's word is his bond. As opposed to a Scots or an Irishman's. No, oh, hardly that. The word is Teutonic, of course, by Old English. Curious, isn't it? The Anglo-Saxon infatuation with bondage. You're giving all of your talk away before we've had a chance to hear it, Dr Bridges. Yes, that's true. It, it's only five minutes long. I'm overdue for a drink, George. Hello, me, dear. Me too, while you're at it. This craving for alcohol is a sorry sight, Dr Bridges. Well, they do say it kills off the brain cells. Well, Serena has no cause for concern on that score. Cheers. Oh, I meant to mention, by the way, I had a phone call from Dublin this afternoon from the director of the National Library there. He spoke very warmly of your work. Oh. He says that all of Ireland is behind you. I should keep a close eye on your rear-view mirror in that case. It seems, however, there is a campaign growing to have the Brendan map repatriated there. That's all I need at this stage. Well, perhaps it could be shared hmm? on a rotating basis. I don't suppose this would persuade you to withdraw your resignation? Just the opposite. Resignation? What does he mean? All right, Mr Mahoney, the game's up. I've been waiting for years for a chance to say that. Harvey, how did you get here? Was he tampering with you on the telephone, Serena? Mother heard it too, on the extension, didn't you, dear? Pierced right through my skull, that scream of hers. Kept yourself lucky it was only a scream. We'll have less of your lip, if you don't mind, Mr Mahoney. Or should I say, Murray? Watch him, Harvey. I wouldn't advise anyone to get any ideas. Both Mother and I are well practised in the martial arts. Harvey, please go home. Not till he's finished his party piece. Come on, Harv, we're all hooked. I presume in the course of time you'll all explain yourselves. Easily done, Miss Pratt. Polo Mint, anyone? No, thank you. Hearing of my need to pursue inquiries in a case in Scotland, Serena requested that I look into our friend Mahoney's credentials. Not a pretty sight, I may say. We'll talk about this later, Harvey, please. That's the thanks you get from her. Once apprised of his real surname, Murray, Mahoney having been the maiden name of his Irish grandmother, I uncovered other revealing facts about this man. In the course of this, Dr Bridges, you may be able to assist us with a problem in semantics which arises inter alia. Oh, really? Such as his dismissal from the Ordnance Survey in Edinburgh and, subsequently, from the United States Navy Hydrographic Office. It has to do with the hopeless inadequacy of yet another group of cognate words. Hoax, fake, forgery, swindle... Stop God. it, both of you! Then there was the matter of his diploma in paleography and his training in the restoration of old documents. Ah, I begin to understand. Let's say a man sets out on a spiritual adventure, Dr Bridges. None of your punting up the Limpopo crap, but a real dangerous gambit in uncharted waters. A calculated transgression of the moral law. You mean a crime? I think you'll find that is the moat just, in fact. Let's say that it starts as a satirical deception, but it gathers a momentum which he hadn't foreseen. Or oh, let's just say that the Brendan map is a fraud, shall we? <laughs> God's sake! Switch that radio off! I'm sorry. But bad timing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I left out fraud, Dr Bridges. You mean you personally forged it, Mr Mahoney? You mean you already knew, Vic? Since the day after the conference ended. Resignation day. He told you. He'd been making it obvious enough, hadn't he? But I wasn't listening, was I? I was too busy believing. It wasn't till the first day home from the trenches that, at last, I was able to see just what I'd fallen for. I never wanted this, Vic. The poem was authentic enough, mind you. Remember the poem? Thus is my most beloved, my bitterest foe. Thus is the sweetest name, the cruelest curse. Thus to aver my love is to lose my life. As the sun sinks, so does my heart. That was the real McCoy. Quaintly enough. Oh, oh, no. Who put the lights out? Right. Nobody move. Ta-ra, ta-ra. Hey-ho for Halloween. 
turnip lanterns to be seen. <laughs> Happy birthday to Leave you. Leave it out, Godfrey. Happy birthday I can't stand to this. You. Happy birthday. Oh. Oh. Steady on, Miss Pratt. That was a nasty tumble. For Christ's sake, put the lights on, Godfrey. I've lost my wick. Kill Oh, my dear Victoria, let me help you out. No, leave me alone. I've had enough. I didn't mean to actually frighten anyone. Why don't you all just go away? You and I and Mother had best pop on down to the police station, Mr Murray. Have I missed something? Why are you and Harvey going to the police, George? Ah, <laughs> uh, Godfrey. What's the good of Mercator's North Poles and Equators, tropics, zones and meridian lines? So the bellman would cry, and the crew would reply, they are merely conventional signs. Very droll, Mr Murray. Other maps are such shapes, with their islands and capes. But we've got our brave captain to thank, so the crew would protest, that he's brought us the best, a perfect and absolute blank. If you ask me, they're all involved. Don't let him out of your sight, Harvey. Lewis Carroll wrote that. I think I had better go also. Oh, must you? It's still so early. I think I should. Goodbye, Mr. Dudley. Bye-bye, Dr. Bridges. Lewis Carroll, the hunting of the snark. I only <laughs> happen to know because it's on one of our courses. English 47. Literature of the absurd, ridiculous and grotesque. Godfrey. Yes? Come here. Yes, Serena? Hug me. Uh, well, very well. The whole point of the thing being that they never actually catch a snark. They think they've got one, but it turns out to be a boojum. Oh. I'd better go and see how Vic is doing. I suppose the idea being that we all start out pursuing great ends, but they generally materialise as boojums. Or, in George's case, a few months in prison. Even after I'd been to see him, you still couldn't credit it. Because I'd been right here when the map was discovered. I can still picture Ragnar Nielsen's horrible toddler with a ripped-up book in his podgy fists. Never dreaming then, of course, it was all a plant. Some woman in America had torn it up months before in a jealous rage. That's how the parchment with the poem on it came to light, genuinely enough. Oh, so he claims. Oh, the literary people accept the poem, but then they would, wouldn't they? Still poem isn't like a map. It can be true without being genuine. The truest poetry is the most feigning, as a great man once said. She's all right. She just wants to be left on her own, poor love. I suppose George had the same idea when he turned the parchment over and started to draw. I could use a lift home, Godfrey. Sorry? I'll just put my face back on. See you in the car. So, let us all raise our glasses to absent friends. Or not, as the case may be. And in this case, very emphatically is. I still say Victoria could have weathered it professionally. Wouldn't have been her, though, would it? Self-renunciation was called for. Immured in some rickety little commercial firm. When you think of us spending our days on tourist brochures and school atlases, not that it isn't useful work in its way. I mean, probably it'd be all right if I was doing it, I suppose. I'm ready! I wouldn't be surprised if that's what he said to her, too. Come in. It's you. Not guilty, Victoria. Believe me. That's a laugh. No, 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 really. I didn't know it was you. Well, not till they told me at the desk. Didn't stop you coming on in. I need a job. I filled in the application form. Here, take it. I uh, didn't mention the prison record. <laughs> it's like having been in the monastery. It uh, makes people wonder about you. Of course, it's always possible I'm lying. 
All those letters you returned unopened were costing me a fortune in postage. Although there again, that's a good reason for needing a job. Same old reptilian charm, I see. By the by, uh, about that wee matter of the map. Save the explanations, George. I know what all your reasons were. My point exactly. You see, I'm absolutely relying on you to explain them all to me. You've got what you wanted. Amusement value. Academic pratfalls. Showing up the vanity of experts with horizons so much less visionary than your own. Near enough to the perfect crime, in fact. Except for the customary one thing that hadn't been allowed for. In this case, a map curator with nice tits. It's great to see you again, Victoria. There was also, of course, your promotional work on behalf of Spiritual Vagrancy and dear old St Brendan, but that was rather less of a winner, given that he's now forever linked in the public mind with fraudulence and moonshine. I never thought your tits were all that great. But I somehow fell in love regardless. Which is why you were prepared to sit back for two years and watch me make an international laughing stock of myself? How could I tell you? I would have lost you. Anyway... You covered yourself in glory. Nobody's reproaching your work. How many early maps are there, proudly displayed round the world, that would stand up to the kind of scrutiny which that map survived? I wouldn't dream of belittling your genius, George, believe me. It was a forgery absolutely of the first rank. As a matter of fact, there's a lecturer in Wisconsin who's currently claiming that the map is really genuine after all. He's convinced you lied about the hoax in a bid for notoriety. Suppose he's right. Who cares? It's not my field anymore. It's not even a field that I'm playing anymore. Hey, Serena. Terminally ill, I trust. Never happier. If she hadn't sicked her pet bloodhound onto me, nothing would have changed. Wrong again. The map might have soldiered on, but we certainly wouldn't. Besides, why should you worry? The public has taken you to its heart. Folk hero of the month. You haven't quite got it yet, Flower. I need you, Victoria. I'm asking for another chance. What have you brought along this time, George? A signed photograph of the Loch Ness Monster. What are you doing in this dump, Victoria? You haven't got the figure for sackcloth and ashes. I do realise you were in the right, of course. Beliefs govern the world, not facts. Facts are as neutral as bullets. And as plentiful. But some of them are small and... Fairly harmless, and that's my area of competence. It's very pleasant here, George. Let me show you out. What about the job? I'm afraid the firm considers you an unsuitable applicant. You have a truly appalling set of references. Goodbye, George. Let me not conclude these heartfelt remarks as they are indeed now nearly at an end, without some final few words by way of drawing to a close, not forgetting in the final analysis what, though last but not least, is the parting shot with which I wish to Christ I knew how to sum up and sign off. Oh, my God. It's nearly twelve. Count myself fortunate. Happiest man alive. It only remains... You never know. He might just turn up. Walk in unannounced. Like that very first time in my office. The man from God knows where. Well, Glasgow, I suppose. Originally. Oh, I doubt it, though. I'm afraid we've seen the last of him now. Old George Mahoney. Truth is, I miss him quite disgracefully. Whisper it not in Gath. Especially just at the moment. Think of the speech he would have made. Think of the speech I'm going to make. Terrible thing he did, of course. But there was more than a touch of the poet about George. For all the joy it brought him. Well, this is it, Godfrey. I suppose it is, yes. After all these years. Seventeen, I think you'll find. You're not feeling qualms? Kill feet, wedding nerves? Seems as though I'm lost for words. Words don't count now. 
We can count ourselves fortunate, then. I couldn't be happier. Happiest man alive, I am. It's just so right for both of you. And here comes the bride. God, I feel like a prune in this get-up. Don't be silly, Serena. You look like a peach. Mm. I hope you've got everything, Godfrey. Oh, look at the time. For God's sake, we should have pushed off already. Get your bouquet. I'll get the car. Ah. Um. <clears throat> well. Godfrey! Godfrey! Friends, family, ladies and gentlemen. A few short words. Pratt's Fall was written by Stuart Parker. The part of Victoria Pratt was played by Isla Blair, George Mahoney by Maurice Ruives, Godfrey Dudley by Michael Williams, Serena Pratt by Susan Wooldridge. The Professor of Celtic Studies and Malachy, Dermot Crowley. The Abbot, James Green. Dr Bridges, John Moffat. Harvey Small and Brendan, Robert Mackintosh. Mrs Small, Diana Payan. Proctor and Erickson, Carl James. Kilroy, Kerry Shale. Cortez and the Pornographic Editor, John Bull. And Mr Rees and Gamble, David King. Pratt's Fall was directed by Marilyn Imrie.